my lovely, lovely imps, my lovely imps, we have a special treat tonight. That's right, it is one of the rare times in which a seed that we planted long ago has bloomed and grown up into something far bigger than we could have imagined. That's right, tonight we are going to be talking about revolution. But we're going to be talking about revolution in an interesting context. Some of you may recall that a very long time ago, not that long ago, but months and months and months ago, I reacted to a video by a content creator by the name of Sisyphus55. Sisyphus55 is a leftist video essayist who did a video called The Revolution Will Not Be Live Streamed. And uh, I reacted to that video and uh, I was somewhat critical um, but I also thought that it was a very thought-provoking video, and I chose to approach it in a very productive uh, manner. And as a result, I ended up sitting down and having a conversation with Sisyphus55, a, an interview we actually had, which was broadcast right here on this very channel. You can find both of these things, if you want to, on my channel. You just got to subscribe and go check it out. But tonight... We are going to be watching the follow-up, the long-awaited follow-up to The Revolution Will Not Be Live-Streamed, which is called The Revolution Will Not Be Uploaded. The Revolution Will Not Be Uploaded by Sisyphus55. And you will be pleased to know that I am featured in this video. The interview that I did all that time ago with Sisyphus55 is at least in some part present in this video. And I'm really excited for this video because the conversation I had with Sisyphus was very good. The asynchronous dialogue that we had from, uh, you know, me watching his video, him watching my critique, and then both of us sitting down, that was really productive. And I felt like it got everybody's brain juices flowing and got everybody thinking about all kinds of stuff. So I'm excited to watch this video. I have not seen it at all. I do not know... Uh, how I am included in this video. I might even be dunked on or insulted. I doubt it, but it's possible that I get completely blown out of the water in this video, but I want to watch it together. Now it's a big video, so we got to buckle in. This is going to be a long form react, but I'm very excited because I think this is a topic that uh, is going to make a lot of sense and get, uh, uh, and get a lot of people's, you know, their, their hearts pumping and their brains working in a direction, you know? It's really funny to me. I don't want to spend too much time setting up before we watch the actual video, but when I first started streaming over four years ago now, uh, thank you, thank you, I know, four years streaming is a long time, but when I first started streaming, uh, people, the, the, the revolution versus reform, the conversation around revolution was all over the place. People talked about it all the time in varying degrees. Um, it was a very contentious topic uh, that, that people had a lot of opinions about. Some people were very anti-revolution. Um, some people had, you know, differing perspectives on it. Um, some people were very pro-revolution. Some people had, uh, you know, uh, Marxist-Leninist views of revolution. Some people had, uh, uh, you know, arguably reformist views of revolution. It was very interesting. It was a topic that people talked about a lot. People don't talk about it as much anymore. It is just not as discussed anymore. And I don't really know what the reason for that is. But we might discover some of it when we watch this video. I think it's a good thing to discuss. After all, we live in America and what is the one thing, or at least I live in America, you guys probably live all over the place. I know you guys live all over the place. But the one thing that America claims to be built on is the American Revolution. Our, our rising up against the tyrannical overreach of the British Empire. And yet no one talks about revolution. It's become a taboo topic. It's very interesting, isn't it? Anyway, without any further ado, Let's dive into the topic of revolution and react to Sisyphus 55's The Revolution Will Not Be Uploaded. Let's do it. As Carl Jung wrote, the unconscious is pure nature and like nature. 
we're going to have to boost that, aren't we? Yes, we are. We are going to have to boost that real quick. All right, let's see how this turns out. Hold on a second. Pours out its gifts in perfusion, but left to itself and without the human response from consciousness, it can... How is that? Is that, is that too loud? Let's check. That seems fine. Again, like nature, destroy its own gifts and sooner or later sweep them into annihilation. And I would submit to you that we are a lot closer to the when than most Americans and indeed most people in the world are willing or able to admit or to face. The level of divisiveness in our culture is becoming toxic. We don't talk to each other. We live in our respective silos. We listen to these podcasts. Those people listen to those podcasts. We don't vote for the same people. We don't think the same world out there exists that way. Our morals, our culture are ripping us apart. That's one sign. Very different from the way older societies understood themselves to be living with nature, not dominating nature. I don't know Andrewism very well, but I do know Chariot, and I adore Chariot. Based. Wow, this video is going to be incredible, isn't it? Killer. Wow. We are really getting, we are really getting every side of this issue. Hoo -hoo -hoo! I'll turn it down a little bit for this part because the music is a bit louder than what I had controlled for. But wow, this is quite a, quite a broad representation of people in this video. I'm actually super, super, super interested in where this is going to go. Culture used to be the backbone of the resistance. All it seeks to do is to date the mass. Culture now seeks to appeal to our primal urges, our base needs. We're now in the age of mediocrity. You can bring about the positive change you want to see in this world. Because the revolution will not be televised. Revolution will not be televised. Only you can bring about the revolution by taking it to the street. Keep resisting. Billy Draw is going to be upset if we don't talk about fashion. You know what I mean? Here Hassan demonstrates, you know, there's a sort of cultural war going on, and uh, nowhere is this battle more apparent than in the space of the online left, where you see kind of a colorful uh, cast of personalities and characters offering a wide range of analysis, critique, and entertainment. The apparent growth and popularity of many of these figures suggests that the online left 
in terms of numbers has been quite successful. However, some, including myself, have put into question the extent to which this space offers real organizational potential and real political engagement. Does online politics transfer into the real world? Is there a meaningful difference between the two? And does the infighting with on online politics hinder the movement in some way? There's also the issue of the contradiction in the sense that many people in the online left have to use the technologies of capitalism in order to critique the system. Above all, I want to add... I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to backtrack, but did this guy... 24 male healthy. I lost an online argument today and got super angry. About 10 seconds later, I just randomly ejaculated. <laughs> That is a legendary screen cap. <laughs> why do yeah, why do I feel like a lot of my previous debate opponents have had that experience? <laughs> Incredible. That's amazing. That's I'm sorry, that's just amazing. I needed to say that and I needed to call this thing out. Let's continue technologies of capitalism in order to critique the system. Above all, I want to ask, is what we are doing here on this space useful? To know if the online left is useful is to first define what the online left is, and also to understand what sort of needs we are striving for, perhaps collectively. In this sense, we don't really need to philosophize too much here. For purposes of simplicity, I would argue that politics exists in the arena of needs, and it's simply an attempt to understand which needs are to be met and how. All we need is as much intersubjective agreement as possible, and then to do something with that. At the end of the day, and I really hope you internalize this, you got blown the fuck out. And it's not because your points are bad, it's because your points are bad and you're stupid. A few months ago. <laughs> go, I made a video exploring online politics from my own perspective. I ask myself broadly if what I am doing and if what others are doing in the online left is useful in making the world a better place. In the end, I reached the cynical conclusion that it wasn't enough. The online left was not being as useful as it could be. I felt like this space was placating my own idea of true political change. And to my dismay, some large streamers and many from their communities felt that my video was myopic, self-destructive, nihilistic, and pretentious. I felt misunderstood, incompetent, attacked, and just plain stupid. And also maybe I went about it the wrong way. In a brief moment of optimism, I saw Vosh, a strong critic of my video, explain his own grievances and wishes for the online left and its audience. I think the key is understanding that through all the disagreement, fighting, and personal bickeries, there are things we can focus on to productively move forward. You know. The key here is that it's a political space, not a social space. Disliking people in a social sense, thinking they are rude or boorish or even have some bad opinions, doesn't prevent you from working with them on issues of critical import. I only hope for a future in the online left where there's a little bit more constructivity behind all of it, because I feel like we're a bit lacking in that regard. You need to have the right people in office, even for radical change to take effect. Unless you're speaking to some kind of genuine revolutionary sentiment, which, you know, good luck, I guess. Uh, I don't, it doesn't really seem to be the environment we live in right now. It doesn't seem to be a realistic venue for change at this time. Uh, I really think we should focus on the avenues we have before us. We're talking about electoralism, which is of course vital, but I think that at the at the fundamental, like personal level, so often it's about convincing a person that what they can do can make a difference, like on any level. It is remarkable, especially at a local level, how much single people can do. After watching this, I felt that maybe I had simply failed to communicate my point, as his message was pretty similar to the one I reached in the video. And I think a large failure of this communication came down to my presumption of others' views and an absence of communication. So I reached out to Vosh, explaining that I think his views on the online left were actually quite similar to mine, and that I would like to talk to him in order to better understand his own perspective. Now his response was interesting. He expressed regret in his tone for how he handled things, described the weight of his audience's expectations, and expressed a surprise at my lack of hostility. This email already demonstrated that this whole non-confrontational approach was somewhat alien in these spaces. I've since translated this needs-based approach to talk to many other people engaged in this online space. The following video is a deep dive into understanding the online left from the perspective of those who have engaged with it. 
I've interviewed politicians, streamers, content creators, and critics of the online left. Do others see the online left as useful? Does the space even exist? In order to find this stuff out, I need to get out of my own head, and I need to talk to other people. And this is what this video is. And then try so I have to say, before we go any further, what an awesome thing to undertake. Um, now, uh, yeah, just, just, what, what an incredible, what an incredible thing to set out to do. N regardless of where this video goes from here, uh, that is a hell of a project to, to, to undertake. And I think that no matter what, no matter what the conclusions of this video are, I think that this is going to be valuable for all of us here watching to reflect on. We are going to, in this video, it seems, receive a broad spectrum of perspectives on this strange anomaly that we call the online left. You guys hear mine a lot, and I feel like I have uh, you know, a pretty unique perspective as far as they go, but here, we're going to get everybody's. We're gonna get a really broad spectrum view on what this space is at, in its current state over the last year or so. And I think that's gonna be fascinating. I'm very excited for that. And I wanna say, no matter how this, no matter where this video goes and where the conclusions are, I am really interested. And I think this is a great premise. Um, yeah. I was one of the cri critics of the initial video uh, obviously, I admitted that at the very beginning, and I will say my I will say my title was a little bit more mean uh, than the actual content of my video. Uh, I was a little bit more like you know uh, uh, I guess a little bit more, but but that's because you only get 120 characters for your title. You know, you only get to put so much in there, and I wanted it to be eye catching and also fairly accurate. Um, but that's all I wanted to say. Let's continue. Let's continue. Trying to change the way and- Oh, he's doing the Gamergate thing. He's doing the, like, uh, SJWs infiltrated our, our media, and they're trying to- Firstly, I needed to make sure I was collecting a comprehensive, holistic sample. Uh, I can tell right now, also, just as a disclaimer for all who are watching, I'm going to try and normalize the audio with my controls to the best of my ability as we're watching this, but I can already tell there's some fluctuation in the audio levels, so I apologize if it's uh, if it's an uneven audio viewing experience. I'm going to try and keep things fairly even to where my voice is so that when I tune in, you don't have to make lots of changes, but uh, I, I can already tell there's some audio ups and downs, but anyway, let's continue. of people that have engaged in the online left. Now, setting aside any sort of personal disagreements or uh, grievances I had with these people's opinions or uh, content, I kind of put that aside and I reached out to as many creators, politicians, um, critics of the online left as possible in order to kind of have a overarching view of what this space means. Here are all of the creators that I reached out to, and here are all of so here's the full list Wait. of the creators that I was able to talk to. Now, Wait, hold on. that I reached out to, and here are all of the creators. So here, so this is the list of everybody who ended up talking. So Andrewism, ContraPoints, Kadia Mboe, Noah Sampson, Alice Capel, Dylan Burns, Kidology, FD Signifier, Hans George Moller, Chariot, Vosh, myself, Demon Mama, Hakeem, Progressive Victory, and Alexander A A Avila. Also on this list was Big Joel, Second Thought. Wait, no, Second Thought was, no, Second Thought didn't make it. Oh, that's interesting. So Second Thought didn't make it, huh? Oh my goodness. Um, later. I'm in the middle. Of, it'll probably be a while, so maybe one more. Thing. Thank you for making me that. Um, oh man, so many people didn't make it in. But I swear, I thought Second Thought was uh, was featured in this video. Well, regardless, let's continue. I don't want to get hung up on this for too long. I I, I was I am very happy that I responded to that email. And uh, anyway, let's continue.
characters that I was able to talk to. Now, I was really only looking for people's emails, so if your email wasn't in your channel description, I just, I'm sorry, I couldn't, couldn't reach out to you. And uh, anyone aware of drama would also be also aware of the fact that a lot of these people have not gotten along before, and... Uh, hey! Oh, true. ...aware of the fact that a lot of these... <laughs> this is my kidology video? Oof! Look, I did not, uh, I did not, I, I did not like Kidology's, uh, uh, video, but, yeah, there's definitely a lot of conflict between all the people here. This is gonna be very interesting. He knows the lore. I was, uh, I was very harsh to Kidology, but I feel that it was fair. Uh, I feel it was deserved harshness, but anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's do this. People have not gotten along before. By the way, if you haven't seen my Kidology video, worth checking it out. Definitely a little bit of a, uh, it was a react that became very dramatic. Let's just put it that way. It got intense. And uh, I just want to use the space here to say that just because they are included in this video together, this doesn't mean that they're all coming together necessarily. And I'm not trying to unify the left. I'm genuinely just trying to get outside of my bubble and talk to as many people as possible. And the inclusion of these voices doesn't necessarily mean I agree with everything they say or everything they've done in the past. I'm really just trying to get an idea of what they think of the online left and what sort of things they need uh, in terms of their own platform and intentions. <laughs> oh, well, here's the thing. You've got to keep in mind, people always love to insult the way that I look. This is a classic example of what happens when your father doesn't pay attention to you. And how did I go about interviewing this group? The last thing I wanted was to initiate the same sort of mudslinging and drama that the online left has been criticized for. At the end of the day, I simply wanted to understand the needs of others. This is where I happened upon nonviolent communication, an approach to discourse that values the understanding and expression of needs over the attempt to simply end disagreements. NVC assumes that all human beings share the same needs, such as the need to be understood, the need to be creative, the need to feel loved, and so on. From this, all actions are simply attempts to meet needs. Violence comes about when we feel unable or are unaware of certain needs not being met. I would argue that a considerable amount of online discourse falls short of being nonviolent and usually involves a great deal of persecution, inflammatory characterizations, and evaluation instead of a discussion of needs. What are the steps to nonviolent communication? Without using evaluative words, what are we observing about the situation at hand? There should be no generalizations here, as generalizing, more often than not, combines observation with evaluation. The second step is to now tie the observation with feelings. How did what you observe make you feel? These feelings should not be communicated as thoughts. I think this is really dangerous. I think this is amazing. Rather, the person should ideally communicate how they specifically feel about what is being observed. Feelings emerge from when our needs are being met or unmet. Identifying these feelings then allow us to connect with one another beyond evaluative judgments. Next, we need to tie these feelings to needs. The feeling of anger, for example, may be related to needing to be understood, needing to feel autonomous, or the need to be competent. Like emotions, needs are thought to be universal in the sense that most of us share similar needs. Finally, through looking at each other's observations, feelings, and needs, each party should be able to now make requests. Requests are clear, positive, and concrete calls to have needs met. This is different from demands, where hearing the response of no will trigger an attempt to force the matter. If a no is received, the individual should not give up, but rather inquire as to why the other party does not want to say yes. In my emails I sent to these creators, I asked the following, with some slight adjustments depending on their position. Here are the results. That is my take, you retarded subhuman f***ing knuckle-dragging dipshit. Have you ever breathed through your nose in your entire f***ing life? I don't think video essayists and, and debate bros are that different. We all agree on the fundamentals of politics. Now at this point, you're probably wondering, what kind of wiener cares about this shit? You're not welcome here. I, I have two skills, and it's non-monogamy and speaking publicly, okay? Do some f***ing research. <laughs> Fart huffing, complete ding dong. Put squid tentacles in the, in the chat for how many calories you were denied as a fetus. Like a guy who just doesn't have a fucking <laughs> brain in his head. Okay, listen. This, this this is an these are some all time these are some all time hits of the insults. All right. 
I wonder I wonder if I should be proud or ashamed that none of my old zingers have so far made it in. It's true, I have been on a much more peaceable arc in recent memory, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yet. Yeah, we'll see. We're only 13 minutes in, so. Firstly, I asked, what are the general observations they have on the online left, including whether or not such a space even exists? This involves defining the left in general. So, like, there is no, you know, no unified political, even ideology, other than further left than, at the time, Barack Obama. You know, st I've always make the comment, starting at Bernie Sanders and then moving left. By the way, when I mean leftist, I mean proper hard left. I mean that you are a dedicated anti-capitalist um, and that you have a understanding of what various social systems entail uh, and whatever you end up picking, if you're a syndicalist or uh, an MLM or whatever else, doesn't matter. As long as you have a fundamental understanding, you've studied it uh, and you can present your arguments in a, in a nuanced and accurate way, um, then you are uh, legitimately a leftist, in my opinion. If you're a... This is something, this is something that Doe has been talking about to me recently, which I think, you know, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I find it funny that, so Doe has been talking about recently, just sort of in the abstract, this phenomenon in online left politics, whereby um, people come into the online left and their experience is basically they come in via... Uh, you know, a, a video or, a, or, or, or whatever, or a, or a Reddit or whatever, and they join a Discord or they join, uh, they start commenting, and they're immediately basically asked to choose their starter Pokemon. Yeah, well, what are you? Are you, uh, are you an, uh, an, uh, uh, an ML? Are you an anarchist? Are you, what are you? What's your starter Pokemon? And they're, they're sort of asked to pick that, and then they're asked to then sort of, as a result of picking that, they then have to, uh, 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 emulate what they believe that thing to be. And it's kind of funny to hear that almost word for word what Doe has been talking about recently emulated here in this answer. Like, um, what type, you know, are you a leftist? Do you disagree with capitalism? Okay, and then what type of leftist are you? Are you a syndicalist? Are you an MLM? Are you an ML? It's kind of interesting. I don't, I obviously there's more context here, but we were literally, Doe and I were just talking about that earlier. Anyway lukewarm social democrat you're not a leftist you're just you're just somebody who wants capitalism with human face uh you're uh, yeah no no comrade of ours some creators express the idea that leftist unity was actually a tired concept well, something that i talk about a lot is that like leftist unity is a like a thought terminating cliche in a lot of ways it is a thing that's designed to silence any sort of disagreement or productive conversation and that's not to say that i don't think that lefties of of different stripes need to sometimes need to work together but like working together can't be browbeaten in you have to just you have to like iron things out and come to disagreements progressivism or the left or you know whatever you want to call this space is like a very big tent and i think that there's going to be personality clashes within that and that's just normal and fine so like the fact that i don't at all get along with some streamer like okay that, that, that that's a thing right but that doesn't necessarily need to be like this this thing that divides the entire community you know what i mean like mm. yeah people people are people and they have interpersonal conflicts right that's not necessarily indicative of like the movement is collapsing and like there's no hope for the left or someone it's like no like we just kind of need to accept that it's an inevitable Ability, that there's going to be conflict within any movement of a given size and that sometimes that conflict is interpersonal and like you can decide how seriously to take one conflict or, or another but I think a lot of them probably aren't actually as worth taking seriously as they seem um, so you know I feel like some people feel like they have to choose teams and it's like no you don't now more specifically what is the online left to answer that we need to know if there's a meaningful difference between online spaces and reality. Some saw it as separate. But I don't do anything like politically, like meaningful, like that's actually um, sort of uh, sort of concerted political actions in the interest of sort of the collective or of people. Um, the most I do is sort of like online and I don't really consider online politics to be sort of the, the genuine understanding and definition that I have for politics. And others saw it more as the same. 
I mean, if, if you're engaging with somebody online and trying to convince them of this, that, the other, making an argument, I don't think there's that much of a difference fundamentally between going to a local meeting or a town hall or whatever and making that argument. I mean, fact is, most people get their news from some form of media, right? Not in-person engagement. You know, the more you talk to, to content creators and people who are, are the sort of people who have constantly been asked to take their online presence and make it into uh, real activism and offline impact, you know, people will say, um, you know, what are you really doing? The real politics is out there. And I think that there's almost a little bit of a danger in the separation of the online and the real. Uh, what we're doing when we make online political content is we're networking for political consciousness. And so a lot of what are what becomes really important to our work is kind of getting people to understand things. Whether there is a meaningful difference between online politics and the real world, it is self-evident that the online left has impacted real political action, as demonstrated, for example, by Progressive Victory, which incorporated streamers like Destiny, Bosch, and Keffels, and motivated their audience to canvas and phone bank. I actually sat down with Cam from Progressive Victory to discuss their experience. Consuming political content online, you don't really walk away with, with an idea of how to make a change, but you walk away knowing all the problems that are, are around you. Our founder and executive director, Sam, um, has been working in politics for decades now, and he kind of looked around and realized that this is a really untouched space. Uh, you know, AOC did her big Among Us stream, but there really just hasn't been a lot of recognition of the streaming space from establishment politics. And this is such a powerful space. Um, you know, some of the pioneering uh, work that's been done here was done by Destiny's community, actually, um, you know, going out and canvassing and knocking doors in Georgia. The response that we saw to that canvassing, just hundreds of audience members flooding out and going to knock doors and a lot of people's first time ever getting involved in politics was a real demonstration of how much um, potential is, is just not being recognized and left on the table. Now, those who were more antagonistic towards electoral politics still saw the space as effective in yeah there's going to be a lot of stuff here that i have my own disagreements with and for the most part i'm going to try unless it's like a really super severe disagreement i'm going to try and let us hear other people's perspectives and not immediately uh respond but you know there's no way that i'm going to agree with every person or every organization's conceptualization of uh, the space or their their influence on the space, you know. So there's definitely going to be some stuff I disagree with. And uh, anyway, yeah, let's continue. In terms of agitation and education, the online left at its very best, and when it's working um, in its very best form, is little more than just the new kind of agitation posters that you mm. see, the kind of revolutionary scrolling uh, uh, scribbles that you see on, on oh walls. God, that, that... This is really funny. I, I know that Doe has not watched this video, but that was another thing that Doe pointed out earlier specifically, was that there's a lot of leftists who basically only see, see their only role as quote-unquote agitation. Wow, that's okay. Doe do operating on a on a psionic level in advance. Kind of graffiti, that's what it is. Uh, and if it's very, very well presented, then it can help put the seed for um, a change of mindset, for a drive to go and educate oneself, to read, and then to eventually join organizations where the real work happens. I think the, the Twitch in that sense, or, or the flow of Twitch, for one, it is participatory, obviously, but it also it fosters a community feeling and a feeling of having someone with you at all times, especially because it's a person that speaks to you. The viewer and the audience and also the streamer has the uh, ability to forget about their own world and about the capitalist existence and focus more on what they're what they're genuinely kind of interested in. So that could be an, 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 a conversation about a political thing um, or about a theory or an idea, etc. And, and I think that's just something because the streamer is there with you and he's co commenting alongside, et cetera, et cetera, that there's an interaction happening that I think is really valuable to perceive, and which is why I see the flow in, in live streaming to be actually much more 
important and qualitatively valuable for um, more of a practical kind of um, self-development versus you know the flow which is passive and you're just sitting and 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 not thinking but perhaps we're getting a little too far ahead of ourselves what is the online left and more specifically what is this idea of bread tube many viewed it as far from the monolith that others do and saw it more as a label that was put on them by their audience uh, just through the framing of the word bread to becomes with more of a socialist leaning because it's talking to I think it's a, in reference to the conquest of bread if I'm not mistaken just through the terminology and the people who consider themselves that I know call themselves bread tubers I would say that is probably the online socialist left people who espouse some form of socialism Marxism it could be anything from somebody who's like a hardcore like Nestor Machno style anarchist to somebody who's maybe more of a Leninist I would say while when somebody says the online left, I would say that that generally means you're left leaning as it comes to the commonly understood political spectrum in the United States, at least in my experience, because I don't interact with a ton of YouTubers outside of the United States, outside of Eastern Europe. I would say that when we talk about the online left, we're talking about people who are generally left wing on the internet. And I don't think there's any specific standard we should point to, like they believe this specific thing about capitalism, but we have general things that describe them or things that are generally left wing. A huge part of the problem is it's a definitional problem, right? Like you have bread tube, you have the online left, you have um, like progressive commentary or just progressive channels, or I mean, it's used kind of pejoratively by the right or even by centrist bread tube, which groups in everything left of like destiny, I guess. Um, obviously the original definition of bread tube, including all the video essays, they, there's a lot of them are still making content and, and doing well, but various subcultures have like spawned off of that. First of all, like with YouTube, there, there is definitely this sense of like community or like a niche, you know, the, the online left or like bread tube or all those things where it's like, when you really look at it, it's, we don't talk to each other as much as people would think, I believe. Like, we do most of our content quite separately, so it's kind of our, our own little business. The online left has really been more of, has really always been more of like a description of a general trend, more than an actual organized space that can be directed in particular ways. The term breadtube was uh, something that was applied by audiences two creators it wasn't a creator initiated to well for one a lot of the bigger bread tubers they never really like liked the term bread tube they didn't appreciate it they just wanted to do their own thing and it got turned into this whole you know point of critique it's like all oh, these bread tube creators aren't doing this or that and it's never what they had intended i think the creators are all very nuanced and different not just in the things that they focus on intersecting identities and things like that but also uh, just the way we go about speaking about leftist quote unquote issues. Other people have categorized me as leftist. Um, I've never actually like blatantly been like, I'm a leftist, progressive, Marxist, feminist, blah, blah, blah. You know, like I, the labels don't really matter to me because I know I'm constantly learning, which leads me to the audience part of everything. Um, I think the online left in terms of the audience definitely has a set of standards and beliefs that they have of what a leftist should be. I gave, I think, my most full thesis in my uh, left tube has a drama problem. In, in that video, I speak to the, the folly of thinking of red tube um, as anything more than a, a crafted or a manufactured kind of like, um, what I call it, um, target audience or a marketing sector. I can't remember the term I used, uh, um, but basically I point out that, you know, the original, you know, bread tube juggernauts, um, they did not organize around any political uh, action or uh, intention. If there's anything that holds these different like online spaces together, um, I don't think it's more a matter of ideas or ideology. It's more just like the audience and algorithm putting groups of people together to talk with one another, um, whether that's like a Reddit community or if that's an audience of people who watch certain YouTubers, it's it's mostly just the algorithm putting groups of people into bubbles. Well, I guess my, the first observation I can think to make about 
what's called the online left is that at least on YouTube and on Twitch, what we're primarily talking about here is essentially a fandom, right? It's not, it's not an organized movement. It's not really even that politically mobile at all. It's kind of like a fan community essentially that revolves around certain content creators. And I think sometimes the fandom gets a little delusional about what it is. I don't think it has to only be a fandom, of course. Like, I think there is a potential there for people to kind of, you know, organize within those spaces or meet other people. It was like labeled onto them and they found themselves like, we're all standing in a room now and everybody talks about us like we're a collective, even though we might not actually even know each other. Uh, I think that that's, that can be an upsetting experience that's sometimes unavoidable um, because of the way that the internet and people have genre brain and they're like looking to create a genre and to create connections. As some suggest, perhaps it is more of a social space than a place for coalition building. I think that a lot of people on the left kind of treat this space online as a social space primarily. So if you don't like a person interpersonally, uh, it you know, the political advocacy kind of dies there. I think that it's a lot of it in our space has to do with that social space conflation. The idea that I might be personally unsavorable and therefore not a worthwhile political ally. Something that I don't believe. There are lots of people on the left who I consider to be personally uh, distasteful, but I'm still willing to work with them on some shared marginal goal or interest, you know, like there's something of value uh, to push for there. And that's not always fun or cool or whatever, but it is how we win. I also observed a common criticism that drama and infighting characterized a lot of the interactions and content in the online left. I think that infighting just really fits into our time. You sort of, I think with the left online, they feel like they're doing something when they're not actually doing anything because there's so many emotions and so much energy being exerted into all these little fights about everything from like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to like using the correct pronouns or what have you. It, it feels like the lunch table politics assumption is also self-fulfilling where if you see everyone operating on the assumption that it's really just whether or not you personally that's funny you should say that. Fortnite, you typed that in chat right before that. Fortnite says it's worth pointing out that Kidology thinks infighting is when you say trans women are women. And then she... Yeah, I don't know. I... Again, I'm not going to try and... I'm going to try not to, like, editorialize on each individual person's things, but... What I said earlier in this piece, that I think that there's a good reason to infight on certain topics, I feel like... Like, Kidology kind of... T, like kind of like did me a favor there in saying that like I don't know I feel like Israel Palestine and whether or not you believe that like trans people are deserving of basic respect I feel like those are issues that are really fucking important and that where you fall on that issue would significantly change your direction with politics, right? Like these are, th some of those things are irreconcilable, right? Like you, I, I don't know how, like you can't both sides Israel, Palestine, like effectively, you, no matter how you slice it, like that is a conversation that has to be uh, disagreed upon. Like you have to, uh, if you're talking to a broad audience and there are people in that s side that say, I think this thing, I think that, you know, X action taken by Israel is okay, and that has resulted in deaths of people, that is not just something you can hand wave as infighting. Those are fundamental, deep disagreements that are matters of life and death. So anyway, not to spend too much time on that, but I, I don't know. That's kind of why I said what I said in the section that I was featured for earlier, which is that I think that on certain issues, you can't just hand wave as infighting. There is a fundamental difference of opinion that cannot just simply be big tented away. You cannot big tent with someone who has a diametrically opposed position on the on the subject of genocide, you know? Anyway. Personally like or dislike someone, you know, you fight, you bicker, you disengage, whatever. That's the whole name of the game. It kind of guarantees that it's always going to play out that way. I feel, I feel like I should make an effort to move away from that, but I don't know what deliberate actions I could take to do so. Because you can't just start reaching out to people and be like, oh, you know, I know that there was a previous assumption of mutual antagonism, but I'm now happy to work with your audience. And I'm talking to somebody who doesn't even do any kind of outreach, so there's not even like a mechanism by which that could happen. It feels like a virtue signal, you know? 
uh, there's stuff that I would go that doesn't even consider that I don't even consider infighting anymore. Um, stuff that oh, am I gonna oh ends up being like explicit harassment. I myself and my partner who I mentioned before have experienced that to an extreme degree, um, where I've had people obsessively um, target my platform and and uh, and and basically spend all their time trying to make sure that I can't continue or can't grow, often for completely fabricated reasons. And I guess that's what I'll say on infighting. I think it's very complicated that it's to a certain degree natural and that we should try and cultivate doing it in a way that is as productive as possible uh, when possible. The, uh, the bigger flaw with the space is not that so much that we're not progressing people because that's sometimes a lot bigger than our capacity, but what we are doing is creating resistance. We're creating barriers. We're slowing people down. We're holding them back, I think, with our bullshit. Um, and I want to be clear, like so much of the bullshit I'm talking about is stuff I participated in at one point or another to some extent, probably not the extent <laughs> that people think um, or an extent that I, I believe would have been possible had I not been targeted in some ways, but definitely participated in. And then it's like once I caught on to like how that not just affects me and like my own personal well-being and the channel health, but also like this is wasting people's time this is distracting people this is pushing people away from these politics another observed feature of the online left was the use of capitalism to promote anti-capitalism one of the critiques i've like continuously seen from the left and the right um and from the center honestly is is the sort of contradictory nature of that like consumer content genre while branded as anti anti-capitalist um and again that, that that's another like varying like needle because a lot of creators will use their platforms for like fundraising or like uh like just awareness and and like they'll shout out like organizations and things like that but that like the biggest creators it, it's very much more focused on um the product which again like i love all these videos i think they're great they're super compelling they make me think in all these different ways but the in terms of the material relationship there's no like skirting around that and i think most of most of like the people associated kind of have a are very sort of aware of that their content is largely putting out prescriptions on the world that they themselves do not abide by at all and sort of the things that they critique about society are ultimately how they are making money, how they are leading their lives. They sort of critique capitalism. Uh, some are very like starkly anti-capitalist, um, are anti-America or anti, well, anti-American foreign policy, but like just anti-American in general. But they live in the United States. They sort of thrive in the United States. Their life and how they lead their life and how they do life uh, is very different to what they are telling others to do with their lives. As far as from like a uh, making a living perspective, YouTube's kind of got the major upper hand and I don't know how we fix it. Um, like pe some people, I this was something, there was a, a, a cycle of discourse that has returned. Back when Twitch politics was a thing, there was this concept of like, should streamers form a union? And I kept going mm -hmm. like, People would talk about it for hours without realizing that you can't unionize in the same way. You're a contractor. There's no union, there's no laws that allow you to be able to create a union in the traditional sense. The the livelihood thing does put us at a at a spot where it's like a, like there's always going to be that risk. There is always the risk because of the the very default of the platform that that like people's livelihoods are staked on their channel success that there's always a a perverse incentive there and it is hard to overcome i think we just have to get as creative as possible and recognize it as like a danger of the playing field because of the way it's structured it's generally one person or a brand that is at the center of a channel and if things go bad for that it could really ruin somebody's life it could make it so that they like and they have their survival staked on that and you know, that, that does put a certain limit on, on what can be done with the platform, but I don't think that it's like a total wash. Yeah, um, and capitalism is very effective at selling you your revolution at a, at a markup, right? So, so like, I do think that that's also something to be aware of, especially when we're talking about the space as a fandom. Like, if is this just like a consumer subculture of 
um, you know, like digital content creation, like, uh, well, it partially is that, right? Um, so that's part of what I mean when I say like, that can't be the only thing you do because, uh, yeah, no, I think that, I'm not sure that quite rises to the level of politics if that's all, all it is. Finally, how did these creators see themselves? Were they influencers? Even defining influencer proved to be quite difficult. And so I, I think it's way too broad of a term because uh, a left-wing content creator on YouTube who's doing long-form video essays is so, so, so different than a left-wing content creator doing content on TikTok. The, the length, the style, how much information you can get in, the information space, the culture on these platforms is completely different. And so they're all influencers, but that, that covers the entirety of left-wing content creation on the internet, period. And so that could mean somebody doing like a Karl Marx-inspired puppet show all the, all, all the way to Hassan Piker, like playing video games and talking about, you know, I don't know, uh, left-wing union organizing. It, like, it's just such a gigantic group. There was also some confusion as to whether those within the space were entertainers or educators. Really, when you look at it, it's about like getting people's attention, using whatever is trendy, whatever is and then bringing value, like adding value to that, adding some education, you know, like some uh, contextualization, uh, historicizing things. So it, it's really all about that for me, like the the, the online left as it exists on, on YouTube. But I guess like maybe out of laziness, maybe because, you know, like you, you want to get money as well, because like this is for a lot of us, this, this is our job. There's also this element of very reactionary element but it's it's very rare that like on this medium that you're going to be you're going to do you're going to be a anything other than an entertainer first and i don't mm -hmm. think that's necessarily a bad thing it's just it's a role um mm -hmm. and so i try to keep that in mind and i try to remember that that like i will talk about serious issues but at the end of the day my my role is still mostly as an entertainer I don't know, in the late 60s, like how many people who got involved in like anti-Vietnam activism, like, you know, how, how, for how many of them did this start with like Jimi Hendrix or like Woodstock or whatever, right? Like, I do think that there's a kind of, um, you know, connection between culture and political activism. But I also like want to emphasize that like, you know, I don't consider what I'm doing to be like activism in any direct sense. Um, and I think that Sometimes people think that by participating in a fandom, they are doing politics, and I'm not always sure that's the case. You know, regardless of whether you want to say that that what a streamer is doing is political advocacy or if it's entertainment, you know, I think that that kind of diminishes the the power that is in entertainment. You know, people form bonds to these creators. Um, Non-streamer related examples, we saw Taylor Swift making a call to action to her uh, fans to go get registered to vote. And the response to that was immense. Taylor Swift's not really political. She, she sings songs, she writes songs, you know? Um, so I, I think that, you know, regardless of whether you want to label the content as um, political advocacy or, or just purely entertainment, there's still a lot of power that exists uh, for an influencer to direct their audience. What do we make of these new and seemingly contradictory and confusing forms of identity? Here I'd like to introduce the concept of profilicity. As argued by Muller and Ambrosio, we are living in a of identity formation beyond the identity making technologies of sincerity and authenticity. Our lives largely function on the basis of second order observation. In a sense, our identities are formed in a strange interaction between ourselves and others. According to Muller and D'Ambrosio, there are three ways in which we form our identity. Firstly, there is sincerity, in which our identity is formed through a firm commitment to social roles. Then there is authenticity, where we create our social persona through committing to our unique and original self. These two methods of identity formation are still quite prevalent across different cultures. However, the complexity of the modern world has left us constantly reinventing ourselves and playing new, sometimes contradictory roles. Due to the amount of information and lack of time we have, most people now navigate the world through relying on rankings and ratings. These validation mechanisms rely on second-order observation. We do not simply look at things directly. 
Instead, we observe things and ourselves in terms of how they are seen by others. In a society where we need to interact with people whom we have no time, no desire, and no need to know authentically or sincerely, we often know each other through prophylicity. Prophylicity is where our identity is shaped by the extent to which we can achieve value under our second order observation. Whereas sincerity seeks external validation and authenticity seeks internal validation, prophylicity simply seeks attention. In second order observation, value, such as financial value, beauty value, moral value, or personal value, is determined by second order ranking and rating mechanisms that determine what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. This promotes exhibition value as the primary value. One's identity then derives value so long as one successfully presents their profile for second order observation mechanisms to verify it. Likes, views, Twitter threads, all fun- Whew, boy, that actually sounds- I gotta, I gotta go back and check out what book this is, because that sounds like a hell of a read. I'll be completely honest. I, uh, I am very interested in learning more about this particular, uh, formulation, because- Boy, does some of what's being said here resonate very strongly. ...to determine the coolness and excellence of one's profile. So, what is a profile? It is a curated self-image that is not just seen, but seen as being seen. And how can one successfully curate a profile? What separates the Voshes and Hassans from the smaller streamers? There are the three core aspects central to a successful profile. For one, there is quantitative attention. How visible and distinct is one's profile? Secondly, there is qualitative acclaim. In simple terms, the profile has a certain coolness to it. Perhaps you are an expert in debates or possess some attractive physical qualities. And finally, the profile has to have normative approval. To do this, profiles must have coherent ethical expectations. In the domain of politics, this means that the profile expresses the correct opinions and takes generally expected stances. The recipe for success, then, is a profile that achieves attention, acclaim, and approval. I also sat down with the man behind Profilicity, or one of them, Muller, um, who has his own YouTube channel, and uh, I wanted to discuss his own views of the theory of Profilicity uh, in terms of the identity of online left-leaning creators. But I think there is this very strong, still, connection between politics and what I call... Oh, I, I know this guy. I have actually had some... I've had some disagreements with this guy's reads of certain things in the past, though I would be hard pressed to summon them up now. Um, but I'm actually I'm, I'm interested to what he has to say about that. That's fascinating. Identity work. It just no. It is just neither uh, working on the basis of sincere identity. I I think no. I don't want to say specifically, but I feel like it was on a trans topic. I watched one of his videos on a trans topic and came to disagreements. Again, therefore, politics are no longer sincere. It's also not really based on authentic identity, and therefore, politics are no longer authentic. It's based on prophylic identity, and therefore, we now have profile politics. And that is, again, is something uh, that is the case both for the left and the right. It doesn't matter which kind of politics. Politics is, and especially, of course, again, on social media, if you do politics, it's also driven by the desire to profile yourself. Now, one thing that came up a lot was how audience expectations and how you see yourself being seen by others could affect your moral behavior, what issues you decide to focus on. Plenty of cases where people clearly want me to just tear into a video and I just ignore it. I, I, I try not to let the audience's expectations taint my perception too much. I mean, obviously, it's not completely avoidable. We're all social creatures. No man is an island, blah, blah. Obviously, even if my decision making is like purely uh, self controlled, like e even if I'm fully on the ball when it comes to what I believe and how I handle what I believe and all that crap, there's still the problem that like uh, there's a selection bias in the content that's actually shown to me, right? Where the audience will still like maybe disproportionately show me certain types of content. As Beyonce's husband once wrote famously, is pious pious because God loves pious, Socrates asks whose bias y'all seek. In other words, is something good because God finds it good? Or does God find something good because it is good? Similarly, is a certain political view seen as good because a profile endorses it? Or do certain profiles endorse political views because they are seen as good? Simply put, under the idea of profilicity, it appears to be both. 
In profilicity, as in sincerity or authenticity, identity and morality can merge. The more prolific credit or identity value I get from the general peer for a moral cause, the more important it will be to me. Now whether the creator authentically and intrinsically cares about the issue at hand is a secondary concern, when compared to how the creator sees themselves being seen by others. The way people, some people view me is not the way uh, I tend to understand and view myself. It's a very depersonalizing thing to have these platforms, especially in this space where we are touching on like a nerve center of a lot of people, like we're touching on stuff that people are passionate and sensitive about. So to, to, to give them grace, I have a responsibility to do something to take the pressure off that nerve. So if me saying free Palestine, you know, ceasefire, you know, et cetera, takes the pressure off the nerve of some people a little bit, then, you know, maybe I should do that. Now, this is neither good nor bad. If anything, Muller observes that any attempt to market yourself as authentically one thing or another is kind of paradoxical. Simply put, those within the online left are simultaneously entertainers and educators, profit-driven entrepreneurs and advocates of socialism. To judge them under the outdated principles of authenticity is unfair. The solution to this is not to become more authentic or to insist on your authenticity, because again, that's impossible if you're operating in an online space. It's just more kind of honest or theoretically reflected if they would understand that they are operating under the conditions of profilicity and that politi the politics they do and they perform is connected with this identity technology of profilicity. I think that is super important for the kind of a, a new understanding of what politics is and how it works. I mean, I, I call Donald Trump thick all the time because he is, he's, he's a pawn. Right? Hold on, I don't speak you gotta translate. Fat ass white is a porn term. Fat ass white girl is the term that I was using. What is it? Is pawn. It pawn? Okay. Yeah. Uh, huh? Okay. I don't think he's thick. He's thick as hell. <laughs> it can be positive. Well, now that we live in a world where the blurred lines between an entertainer and a politician are pretty, you know, accepted, um, what then can we talk about in regards to how people feel in these kind of new spaces of identity and politics and entertainment. So I next asked these creators how they feel about the space, moving towards more evaluative language. Seeing things in terms of profilicity could be used to defend against one of the common feelings many of the creators felt about the space. They take themselves a little bit too seriously. As, as lefties, we tend to have very high opinions of ourselves intellectually, especially when compared to our opposition. It's not like fascists know what the f they're on about, right? So comparatively, we know a lot more. Um, and as a consequence of that, we, we tend to think that we're above certain modes of engagement. And there's always this like, you know, well, the proper revolutionary would do this or the proper advocate would do that. And I think often it's, it's, it's kind of misguided, you know, um, political relevancy is largely up to our willingness to get down in the dirt and engage with the mediums that people actually pay attention to, whether that be YouTube or TikTok or whatever else. You know, we're not all Trotsky, uh, Trotskyites like uh, handing pamphlets out at a, at a street corner. We need to be where people are. So, before we go any further on this, I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear more about this profilicity concept. Um, but even as I think about it, it's like, I mean, there's a certain amount of that that's true even outside of the social media world right like i mean just as a as a small anecdote i i think of that that one saying that people say where they're like you know uh it's an adage i don't remember where it's sourced from but i'm sure you've probably heard it yourself where it's like uh all people have three faces the face that they show the world the face that they show only their closest loved ones and the face that they show no one else except for themselves. Um, and uh, I, I, I wonder, like, while the, the profile is, is certainly, it's like a magnification of an already existing thing, um, I don't know that you could say that authenticity, I mean, 
maybe you could make the argument that authenticity doesn't matter anywhere and maybe never did by that by that menta mentality and uh but I don't know how I, I, anyway all I'm trying to say is that I'm I'm interested to see where these concepts go because the initial portion of the statement you know pointing out this observation that like uh the idea that that, that like there is such a reliance uh especially on the internet on uh, uh, the the second order, what they call the second order observations there, the like ratings or the perceived ratings of things, um, you know, whether or not many people in the app, you know, many people perceive something to be good is is fairly important. I, I wonder if that's not, you know, a simply a, uh, you know, a, a reaction to the amount of information we're given and, and I don't know. I, I I was interested in the concept, but I don't feel like like there's been enough here. I see some people in chat reacting to it differently. It it's thought provoking. I'm interested to learn more. Uh, but anyway, uh, that was a bit rambly. But I, I figured I would I would uh, share some thoughts. Let's continue. Um, creators that are in this space think too highly of themselves, or but better yet, think their power far too. Much, far greater than it actually is. I think that shows in the petty squabbles we get in. Um, I think that shows in the way ego, you know, plays out in this space. Um, and again, I think that shows in the the way that uh, you know our communities respond to us. Now, is it wrong to take yourself too seriously? This suggests that what we do has impact, after all. In his essay, Constituents of a Theory of the Media, Enzinsberger argued that the new technologies of mass media, if freed from the hands of government and big business, uh, could actually be emancipatory. Every reader, as it were, should write his own book. As he argued, these new forms of communication will make us happier, more creative, and more politically engaged. And this was something we can see in the optimism of many who I interviewed. Some have argued that it has actually rejuvenated the left. I'm sure all of us get emails from time to time saying, hey, I really like your videos because of you. I joined XYZ, you know, that sort of thing. Like I've gone and spoken at a couple of like DSA or CPUSA meetings and I'll ask people like, hey, are you, do you know the like my work? Are you familiar with the stuff that I've done? And then at one of them at like a DSA one at a local Texas um, branch, I went to a school and they were having a meeting and the facilitator asked people to raise their hands if people there had gotten involved with the group because of my videos and like I don't 25% of the the room raised their hands the flow of information and how easy it is for everyone online to take ideas that forever was paywalled uh, or in a like either ideas that were kept within the academia space right and you had to have like academic journals to go through um, or was just kept out of the conversation because it wasn't profitable for mainstream news or wasn't considered, you know, palatable for mainstream audiences. These ideas can be given a breath of, a breath of fresh air and then freely transmitted online in a way that is rejuvenated. It has rejuvenated leftism and left-wing ideas around union organizing, left-wing ideas around co-op building, um, other ways of building the economic system outside of being purely profit driven under a capitalist market. Of course, there are areas for improvement, but I think in some ways it was actually su such a success that we're now asking completely different questions than, I, than anyone would have been asking back then, right? Like we're now asking like, oh, is this going to actually affect real politics? And like, are, you know, is this going to get anyone elected to office, right? Those are like big questions. Like, whereas at the time it was about like, oh, let's change this culture on YouTube. Um, I think the culture is largely on YouTube has changed. Right. In the sense that there's now this like gigantic industry of video essays analyzing culture, mostly from a, a, a left of center perspective, I would say. So in that sense, there's been like a complete reversal of, of the culture. New media and, and social media, which is obviously part of it, uh, requires kind of a reexamination of that of that concept. And and I again, I argue for it being actually being very beneficial for social movements because it does get people on the ground. It does encourage people to participate. Again, I'm, I've mentioned Hassan, I mentioned Vosh, et cetera, that are, doing, um, that are doing entertainment, but at the same time, they do have a concrete message, right? They do have an image, an idea that they 
convey to the audience um, in some way. They have like a myth that they that you can concretely say. So, what is Hassan's goal? And he often says his goal is to um, mobilize people to um, maybe convince right wingers who come in to bash on him, but then stay for longer and then realize, oh, he's actually not that bad. And oh, actually, I believe I I, I, I agree with this point. I never thought of this, etc. Um, he has many cases where he mentions, uh, you know, people in his chat that are saying like, oh yeah, I used to be like a Nazi, and now. I completely changed my 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 ideas and my 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 um, my goals, etc. So in that sense, like I think that his streams are really um, strong, right? I'm not saying it's the entire time, but it has these instances where it's extremely strong. And here, perhaps Enzenberger was correct, but then came cynical old Baudrillard, who criticized his idea of these technologies, of you know ever having the potential to be emancipatory. As Miller and Ambrosio write, his main point was that even a liberated mass media would not... By the way, if you are enjoying this uh, react and analysis so far, you've been enjoying watching this with me, first of all, make sure that you press like on the stream right below, or the video if you're watching this as a video, and secondly, make sure that you go press like on the original video, which I will link right now in both of my chats, and of course, will be linked in the description down below. Make sure that you go give a like to Sisyphus55. Um, yeah, we want to share the love. Bring about a free and equal society where everybody would interact productively with one another. To the contrary, in mass media, everyone was taking part in a mass exercise of speech without response. Instead of this beautiful online space of cooperation, debate, and creativity, we could find ourselves instead with everyone being awarded with their own monologue and with very little dialogue or constructive communication. According to Baudrillard, we became more alone together. So if, if people like perceive some initial threat, obviously it'll, it'll increase the likelihood that they're like initially defensive or won't want to get engaged. Or people will think, oh, well, he's being nice now, but if ever anything negative happens with him, he'll turn the dogs on me. And then like, it'll be six months of protracted drama. I do think that like, it is very frustrating to be misunderstood. And every once in a while, I get these like very jarring experiences where I'll see somebody out in the wild, like on Twitter or whatever, who dislikes me and they will dislike me with a passion that I reserve for the love I feel for a partner. I, it's something I'd like to put to rest, ideally. Obviously, it's not really possible, because if you if you dislike a person, then everything they have to say gets framed in a negative light. Like, if I say, oh, I'd like to put all this to bed and get along with people, or like, you know, ah, I may feel wronged by this disagreement, but that doesn't matter. We're going to work together on this. For a lot of people, it's like, ah, he is, he is snakishly trying to avoid culpability for his crimes. The audience is also drawn to what is reactionary. This is what drives clicks boosting one's profile. Unfortunately, this also compromises the very authentic creativity and productive communication that Enzensberger was hoping for. Maybe out of laziness, maybe because, you know, like you, you want to get money as well, because like this is for a lot of us, this, this is our job. There's also this element of very reactionary element that sometimes we, we have to do that sometimes, you know, because, yeah, you, you want to get some attention, but at the same time, it's like, kind of betraying our core values, which is all about education, critical thinking. So when you put forward someone like, you know, Andrew Tate, there has been so many videos about like the manosphere, Andrew Tate and people like that. It's like, okay, great. You're using that very extreme uh, figure to bring interesting points, but you actually have to bring those interesting points and also show like how someone that is super extreme uh, as, uh, you know, someone like Andrew Tate, is also the result of other things that are less extreme. And one persistent feeling that comes from this appears to be a sense of alienation in creating content. I think there's for sure a, a level of like wanting to do good generally or wanting to like succeed that, that drives that. But um, for, in terms of the material analysis of it, yeah, it's, it's like very immediately um, whatever value or feeling that's there is, is just incorporated into the system. And so as as it's changed and evolved i think that yeah like like the critique of all the larger channels is that is that it moves the needle moves slowly more to the center or slowly more to just broad progressivism and i think it doesn't have to happen but i've definitely felt that like pressure when i'm deciding on like 
how to talk about something or or what like what i how i want to like what i want to cover I, i'd say the, the cases in which that happened or i felt like mm, i could have done a better job it's mostly when i see a trend online and i'm like i need to talk about it so i need to find a concept to attach to it i need to find a cool philosopher i can talk about so that's usually what i do and usually like, uh, it, it never ends well like i always end up like not really liking the content because it's like oh yeah i need to produce it right now and i need to take advantage of that trend this among other things that right there what's being discussed right here is interestingly as i said this is a fresh watch i have not seen this before but something i was talking about just a little bit earlier in the stream uh if you're watching this as a video go check out the vod this is originally from um uh, over on the live panel you can find it pretty easily over there um but uh was this idea that that uh there was a period of my channel when I was uploading every day and I experienced a lot of growth from that. Uh, YouTube rewarded me very well during that period of time uh, with rapid growth. We were growing really fast, but uh, it required, you know, it required a lot of, a lot of that. It required um, grabbing things on a day-to-day -day basis and getting them out as soon as possible um, and in the long run, while I wanted to give it a try to see if I could keep up with it, it, it was not sustainable for me. I don't think it's sustainable for most people. And I do think that, that uh, you know, while I made a lot of stuff that I was proud of during that time, there was also, there was a constant strain. And I always felt like I was doing, I was, I was talking about it with less preparation, less thought, less inspiration than I wanted to. Um, and I think that all of this ties into this idea that, like, you know, the content machine. Uh, and it's especially prevalent for people who are on YouTube. The YouTube is a, it is brutal in how much it wants you to, uh, to maximize your volume constantly. They want the platform to be always full of things for, pe for people to watch so that no one ever leaves, so that they can turn it on when the moment that they wake up and not turn it off until they fall asleep. There's always something they want. YouTube's ideal is that there is always something. And so they want all their creators churning everything out that they possibly can at the maximum level. But the reality is that that takes that severely, and I mean severely, not even minorly, it severely diminishes quality. And not just diminishes quality, it diminishes um, it, it diminishes the 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 well being of every of the entire platform. It's a it's a fire hose approach that is not sustainable that degrades the the long-term wellness of 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 entire channels and arguably and, and in my opinion the entire platform as a whole and there doesn't seem to be uh you know any serious way to deal with it at all except for creators basically making out of their own volition saying nah i gotta take a hit i gotta you know or you know or the opposite saying fine then I'm going to just churn out. I'm going to jump on every trend. I'm going to talk about every subject that's popular regardless of whether I actually feel strongly about it because this is what is good to grow the platform. And uh, I I am personally in the camp that says, nah, um, if it means that some at some point my channel is no longer viable, uh, then I'll make something else. Um, but but uh, I can't do that thing i can't do that and and the pressure is there uh anybody who steps onto this platform and tries to make anything on this platform or any other platform like it will feel the pressure the constant uh, uh call to make more to make more 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 and it's never what you're making it's always more that's the thing it's it, it is it is always make something else um you know I feel like, I mean, there's the proof of this is is in the streamers that will stream eight to twelve hours every single day, six or seven days a week. Um, you cannot prep for that. You will be reacting in real time to other things as they happen. You cannot be doing original stuff that entire time. And some of these, uh, you know, as we've seen with increasing controversies over like content theft. You know, the, the sort of 
what they call the, the lazy react streamer or the empty chair streamer, where it's like, well, I'm gonna go eat lunch and go to the gym. But because, in, because you're a huge streamer with a massive following, you don't wanna lose anything. So you just put somebody else's video on in the background and get up out of your chair and walk away. Now, obviously, every streamer's got to take some breaks, you know, walk to the bathroom and whatever, and there's varying degrees of this. But the fact that there are streams in which a streamer could just get up for an hour and not even be present, um, you know, it, it, it speaks to the state of, of, of affairs, the state of the unrealistic expectations and the demands uh, for a never-ending fire hose of content that simply cannot be created. Uh, with any reasonable quality. And uh, I don't think it will keep up forever. I think it's a bubble um, that will pop and will pop brutally. Um, and it's, <laughs> even in its current form, like the, the, the screws have been tightened, you know? Not to go off on too big of a thing, but on this point, it's something that really gets to me. It's just like, I've talked multiple times, I've been very open about like how many hours of content I have created and not just what I've created. It's not that nobody is watching. I've, I've, get, I've read out to you all the amount of hours people have spent watching on my channel. And then we have compared that to the amount of money I've actually been able to pull in from my channel. Um, obviously money isn't the only thing that matters. Obviously there's some pretty wonderful, I've been sent some wonderful art from fans. Those things are very precious to me, but obviously this platform is selling people jobs, you know, and the amount of hours people have watched for how much money I've actually made on this channel, it is astoundingly, the ratio is astounding. It would shock you um, to know how little the money actually is for how much time of others you are providing entertainment for. Um, I recently, I didn't even celebrate this. We didn't have an opportunity. I recently hit 5 million views on my content. 5 million times people have tuned in to watch my stuff. 5 fucking million. You hear that? I'm going to say it again. 5 million. Okay? And we've blasted right past that. Uh, it's a huge number. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> the amount of money I've made on this channel in four years with 5 million people tuning in with an incredibly high uh, watch time, uh, an above average watch time for channels uh, by a long shot. Uh, you know, having been able to say, oh, I've made like less than half in four years, I've made less than half of what I've, of what I made, uh, in a, in a, in a sales job in one year is crazy. Now, obviously I have my website, which makes things feasible financially, my website. And those of you who contribute to my website directly change the, they, that, that's a game changer. It changes everything. Um, but I've talked many times. I mean, I have 310 viewers right now, which is amazing. Uh, that is what is largely considered to be a uh, unfathomably successful stream. Most people do not realize that uh, I am in the, somewhere in the ballpark of the top 0.8% of all streams that have ever existed as far as viewership. Uh, that's right, 0.8%, 0 0.8, not 8%, 0.8. Uh, as far as raw statistics are considered. Um, and, uh, you know, well above the top, you know, well in the in the ballpark of the top one, somewhere in the ballpark of the top 1% of YouTube channels by subscribers. Um, and, uh, uh, <laughs> and the, the, what you get back from the platform, YouTube is making a lot of fucking money, okay? YouTube is very rich. They're raking in a lot. They're making money off my videos right now. A lot of money. And what they pay back out is pretty low. So the incentives here are very messed up. And all I'm saying, uh, this is a sort of long way of me stating and setting the stakes for why the pressure is so incredible 
and why the culture around churning out content uh, and jumping on trends is so severe, you know? And so many creators either say, that's it, I'm done. They, they fold, you know, they put their cards on the table and they back out, I'm done. Or they break bad, so to say, and they start jumping on every single trend and, and churning out, you know, everything that they possibly can at every moment. Yeah. Whew. Let's continue. Let's get back to the video. This has translated into a general pessimism or cynicism expressed by many. Namely, the portrayal of values and the need to get out content quickly has left some creators disappointed in the space. There's a lot of people who really generally don't believe that there will be anything other than capitalism in our future. Um, and so that, that kind of seeps into how they discuss other issues. They really don't seem to see, you know, a lot can happen in a very short space of time. You know, things that seem eternal, such as, you know, the divine right of kings, turned out not to be so in the end. And so I, I, I don't want us to be like fatalistic about this, like, oh, you know, well, capitalism is this global thing and it's all this power and there's nothing we can really do. And uh, very often what I, f I feel like a lot of people in these spaces and not even people who define themselves as, you know, they're they're doing this a git prop constantly. But people even in I IRL, you know, they have nobody to shout these opinions to except the void and the void does the only thing the void ever does is shout it back at them and make them feel like they're a part of an actual cohesive movement well at the end of the day they're totally alone you know political opinion without material consequences not even political it's just all virtue signal and it's 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 venting so mm. i really hope i cannot i don't have like literally anything to prove so i have to just run on hope that what i'm doing is not just venting into the space initially of just like left content i had very much more of a uh a like a i would have called it an optimistic at the time but now i i kind of see it as naivete where um like there's an ins inspirational ideal of like change and 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 effect enacting change by growing a platform to like educate or organize and things like that and it it is kind of a sad story that over time my my like view of how that my view of the possibility of that has become much more cynical and i mean i myself have gotten like dragged into like beefs between creators every month every six weeks to a month i i get like a little depressed and then start scripting out i like write 10 pages about all the videos i've ever made that like had kind of poor arguments or like when people criticize me and i like agreed with it like i do a whole kind of self-loathing self-punishment thing um which again it, it's it's fine and good to engage with criticism of course but not when you're doing it because you just kind of hate yourself and are sad and, and like you guys remember how i said i was never gonna do another one of those uh well some of you probably don't remember this because it was a long time ago a long time ago when i was a baby streamer i did a critique stream a bunch of people, I kept getting this. People kept saying, oh, Demon Mama doesn't listen to any critique ever, blah, 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 which really fucking annoyed me. And so I did a stream where I just let people come in and critique me. R biggest regret of my fucking life. Um, it was a total, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a depressing experience. And I learned afterwards that it didn't really do anything no, even though I literally let some of my worst critics say whatever the fuck they wanted about me to my face on stream uh, uh, in front of everybody, they didn't care. They didn't. They would still say that Demon Mama never listens to criticism or uh, uh, or or is 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 just ignores all criticism. Even when I was sat there and talked back and forth about it and explained my approach and position, it was a total waste of time. So, yeah. Yep. That's um, kind of another part of it that it fuels the cynicism is like, um, not only is the leftist advocacy we do a lot of times um, fully capitulated, but also it can be counterproductive. It can be 
what's another word for counterproductive that's like ha like harming it goes beyond just not being not helping to like making the left look bad oh wow. am i doing something right now that isn't it, it, it isn't really what i'm supposed to be doing um I was out running errands this morning. Uh, I went to get groceries. A man approached me in a, in a parking lot. He was raising money for a fundraiser. And I had that, that little question where it's like, oh, what am I supposed to be doing here? Because I don't have unlimited money. In fact, I don't have very much money. And nevertheless, he's not asking for a lot, and it's for a good cause. And so I, d I, did, I did give it to him, but, but I don't know if I always would have. And there's a, there's a question of my own you know, morality and, and my own role in that? Am I, am I making the right choice or am I just being way too self-conscious and neurotic in the way that I think a lot of streamers and content creators can be? This has been expressed in the feelings of politicians who have actually worked with the online left. Well, social media creates obviously very positive uh, modes of connectivity, conversation, and so forth. The, the positive is definitely there. However, I see in the American left today a tendency to think and act as though just talking about it is somehow achieving the change. At a certain point, you've collected the data. The era of the data collection is over. At a certain point, an endless analysis um, no longer serves. At a certain point, you have to get into the solution. That takes a level of courage that I, and spine that I don't see exhibited quite as much as I'd like. I, I'm seeing a lot of brand protection. A lot of, it's funny, for a supposedly anti-capitalist crowd, I see some of the worst shadows protecting with brands, not wanting to upset your audience. Uh, okay, but to be fair, to be fair, Marianne Williamson, to be fair. Your peeps might not like it if you say you like this candidate or not. I mean, it's really pretty fascinating. So disappointing. To I've be fair, Mar Marianne Williamson, 2024, for, for president, with the branded, literal branded background, with her name as Marianne2024.com in Discord. To be fair. Seeing that there's a smug, self-righteous uh, unwillingness to get involved because it might cut into my audience um, on the left as much as anywhere in the private sector. Some attribute this pessimism to a lack of direction in the space. Yes, by definition, if you are a streamer, if you are a stream careerist, you are a brand. My name is right there. My name is all over your screens. We are brandified, whether we like it or not. But uh, I don't know that that in and of itself is all that valuable of an observation. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to jump on every individual person's thing, but I just thought that was very funny. Let's continue. General. So when you compare, for example, uh, let's say uh, the European or American left, um, with other places in the world, yeah, there's quite a lot of internet stuff, but uh, the organizations are f f very sad. Uh, otherwise, they're they're not very good. Um, we're not. That's that's not not me being entirely fair. Um, they're not as developed as they could be, given the size of consumption. Nasty says branding can kill the joy of creativity so fast. Yes, that's true. All I'm saying is that we have no choice. Um, in that front there is it is a it is required by the platforms as they exist that people brandify themselves when you build a youtube profile they ask you questions about your brand not about you they ask you questions about your brand what's your website what are your social media accounts what do you describe yourself as please post a trailer that gives us an idea of what you're so yeah we are brandified constantly social media loves brands because brands are quantifiable uh they are they are they are easy to pitch you can pitch a brand at people you can you know it's a tidbit thing that you can say this is what this person's all about now obviously uh not even the most brandified brand is that honed down uh even mcdonald's and coke uh are not truly 
uh, characterized only by what they wish, what they what they claim to be. You know, like uh, I don't know, uh, you know, Mountain Dew. You know. Mountain Dew isn't just the gamer's soda. You know what I mean? They're also the company that did like 900 flavors, uh, uh, 800 of which were total flops, and another fucking 70 of which were not that good or were just the same flavor over again. You know what I mean? So all I'm saying is that over... Yeah, we are all branded. We are all coded and locked into brands to a certain degree, but I 100% agree with you that that like... Uh, uh, becoming too locked into a brand image, letting the brand, the brandification of the internet control you, uh, l like giving up and falling into the brand will totally, they, it, will, it will be like leeches. It's like inviting a bunch of leeches to suck you dry. Um, yeah, it, it will. It will completely consume you. Um, and the best example of this is that that article um, that Mr. Beast uh, was interviewed for very recently um, in which Mr. Beast said, I don't really have a personality anymore. In fact, I found that the best way to continue growing Mr. Beast as a channel was to remove um, my personality from it entirely and listen only to what, uh, you know, what the algorithm and what the demands of the audience were, was to meet, meet those... Um, you know, to, to, to find the, the common denominators that brought more and more people on. And that, that was a fairly eye-opening that uh, the number one YouTube channel, the ultimate experience in what happens if you, if you not only give yourself completely to the brand, but become the icon of what it means to build brands, of what it does to the people who do that thing, the humans that are inside of that machine. The reality is... It leaves you less than a skeleton. It leaves you less of a hollow. Mr. Beast really said, I've won, but at what cost? Straight up. Straight up. Rainbow Krampus says, Demon Mama is very brand coded. Well, it's a, I mean, Demon Mama is both a brand and a personality. Uh, I, uh, like, a lot of who I as an individual, me, the person right here, like, I am a particular, like, I put a lot of myself into the Demon Mama, but but Demon Mama is not all me. You know what I mean? Definitionally. When I, uh, when I get up and walk out of the room, you guys don't see any of that. And that's a good thing. Anyway. Let's continue. Consumption. The base of consumption for leftist... Rainbow Krampus says, why does she always look at my dumb jokes? Media, uh, particularly in far left, um, online, in the English language. I would like the left to be in a position where they're able to kind of um, culturally take advantage of positive movement, you know, not isolate themselves from mechanisms of power, but rather be in place to take credit for good things that happen. Um, but I don't know. I feel like the online left has moved further from that. I wonder if this is all getting folded into like the TikTok space or maybe if there's just less of a market for being lefty and more of a market for either being sort of pol politically disaffected populist or just being like a social Democrat who likes Biden. I don't know where people go from here. Who could provide such direction? It would have to be those with the most attention on them. One aspect of profilicity is in the assumption that only a few can be high profile, and the other, lower profiles, must find a way to cope with their situation. Also, the reason I'm covering it is because I saw a video from a larger creator talking about it, and that's how I even know about it, you know? Like, it's like a, a platform, a platform, um, what's the word? Like a function of the platform that, like, the, the discourse and the types of topics covered are very much like trickle down effect. Not for everyone. I mean, for I think for me and a lot of other like commentary people, general commentary people, that that that's the effect of like everyone's contributing to a specific um, discourse in their own way. But a lot of the a lot of the creators that do left content do totally original stuff, which I always respect and I always like like find interesting. But lately, I guess I've had that more cynical view that like you know we're all just kind of churning out slop 
In order to cope, these lower profiles must stay relevant by constantly talking about the higher profiles and what they like to talk about, whether it is in a positive or negative light. One could argue that productive intersubjective collaboration is threatened by this sort of hierarchy. Pond Curtis says skill issue. Um, nah, I I gotta be completely real. I I think uh, w what Noah Sampson has said in this has been uh, very, uh, in in my opinion, fairly vulnerable. Um, and I I think that if if you if if any of you out of my audience stepped into the creator space, I imagine you would be feeling the same thing. The pressure to create slop is unbelievable. You could argue that the pressure in these spaces is so high that it slowly try it's slowly struggling to turn you yourself into a form of slop. Um, yeah, it's it's just uh, it's tough. It it is tough, and uh, the there is a it it the the idea that you have to to refer to to what the interests of the highest profile we've seen that kind of shit over and over again right that like when there is a personality that is so dominant in a space that you have no choice whether you want to or not to hear about their bullshit um it sucks it sucks because um because uh, you might not be able to do what you want to do at all in any way unless you pay some level of homage to this thing and the answer is just oh what you don't do it then well that kind of sucks right you just don't ever create video stuff you don't ever stream or at least you do so with the intent of knowing that you're never going to be able to you know you're never going to like that nobody's going to be able to see it i think that it's hard and i don't think it's as easy to uh i don't think it's so easy to write off I do believe that you that that like ultimately it is down to the to creators to make the decision to uh, participate or not. But ubiquity of of certain subjects, as dictated by very very popular and powerful figures, is it's a real deal. It's a real thing. Yeah, it's a it's a real thing. I mean, hell, uh, you don't even have to be a creator for this to be true. Um, Look at the way that people post on social media. Look at the way uh, uh, Nasty here just said, gotta post every day, gotta post, gotta... But Nasty, straight up, people who have no financial incentive will post themselves into the ground and ruin their own lives by a compulsive need to post, uh, which is, is taught to them by an algorithm that rewards them when they post. And then they think, well, I'll stop being rewarded. No one will care about me and I'll die alone. It's kind of a demented situation we live in right now. And uh, social media platforms are fairly twisted in how much they wrench the arms of their users to produce slop. Anyway, let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue. It can feel like there's only enough attention to go around, as if it was, in a sense, scarce. Scarcity is simply the feeling, and at times, the reality that there is not enough for everybody. What is not enough could be food, money, and even clout. Jean-Paul Sartre observed this scarcity mentality as a defining feature in the failure for leftist movements to effectively organize. Most organizations, as well as the actors within them, were all effectively pushing for the same thing. Nonetheless, the fact that they had to battle for attention and resources made their relationships with each other antagonistic. Scarcity made them focus more on securing their own needs over the sort of broader collective needs that require collaboration. From this, Sartre developed the idea of seriality. When collectives of individuals stand in a relation to one- Ah, wait, I've been lo- We've been reading about seriality in my reading of Deleuze with Doe. <gasps> Deleuze does not have a straw, does not have a positive opinion of seriality, but that's okay. One another in such a way that they remain isolated from each other. We may be brought together pursuing the same goals. We may all be shopping at the grocery store, all looking for the same discounts, but instead of working with each other, conditions of scarcity push us instead to simply work beside each other. And at its worst, scarcity persuades us to work against each other. 
The only thing individuals within seriality have in common is what they are presently doing. Nonetheless, they move in an atomized and at times antagonistic manner. Other creators shared a sense of this scarcity and seriality. YouTubers are contractors. We are uh, sort of um, sometimes working towards the same end, but without any bridges between us. Immediately, it, in my mind, and I know it's in other people's mind as well, because then I see all like the criticism, etc., the, the the fights happening on Twitter. When this, they're, they're dealing about the same topic, there's always this sort of, aha, she stole it from you, you know, like, or they stole it from you, or, or whatever. It's like, oh, you covered it better than this person, or whatever. So it's like, the, the sort of um, the panic around intellectual property um, is quite strong because that's also a thing it's like because we we all are we have our own little businesses basically as video creators um it is kind of tempting whenever there's a trend to be like oh i'm gonna be the person cover covering it you know i want to be the first one etc this scarcity the need to cover a topic that everyone right else is as quickly as possible can also diminish the quality of the content uh speed and quick and jumping on a topic as quick as possible is prioritized algorithmically across all of social media. This is not just a left-wing problem, but it also can get scarier when it's political and we're dealing with facts, we're dealing about wars, we're dealing with human tragedy. And and I'm worried that due to the uh, economic, because it is profit-based, a lot of this content creation too, uh, even when it's socialist, it's still profit-based, you're still trying to you know make money for yourself. Um, I, I think that a lot of the speed to get stuff out there's not a lot of effort put into or not enough effort in the amount of time given. And so sometimes it's not even me saying like these content creators are just so unbelievably lazy. It's just they feel like they need to immediately comment on a story right when it happens because they have thousands of viewers in front of them or that's when their video is going to do the best. And so instead of sitting down and doing the proper research, it's information, 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 information. Keep you guys entertained. Keep that number on the screen up. And I think those incentives are maybe good for video game playing and like being funny. Like you can kind of crank up the humor a little bit. You can like try a little bit harder in the video game, get friends on. But when we're talking about trying to ascertain information about an ongoing war, um, these incentives I think are a real problem in the streaming space, particularly since streaming is as it happens, but not even just in the streaming space. I've seen a lot of uh, uh, other leftist content creators who are outside of streaming make mistakes on social media all the time as well. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm completely innocent of this. This is something that I first had to check in myself before I, you know, so I saw it in others and then I saw it in myself. On the topic of misinformation, the escalation of the Israeli-Palestine conflict after October 7th, for example, has of course been covered extensively by those on the online left. In my own attempt to understand the Israeli-Palestine conflict more, I actually started using Ground News, which is a website and app created to give readers a transparent way to read the news. With access to over 50,000 news sources across the political spectrum... Hey, wait a minute, this is an ad! Wow, that's a, an incredibly smooth transition into an ad. Shockingly so. Concerningly so. All right, let's finish the ad. We'll be polite this time. ...leans per article, giving you the complete overview of every story. Although I can't offer you better news, I will say that ground news is definitely a better way to read the news. There's also a blind spot feature, which I really like, that highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum. For example, I used Ground News to research a recent story on the killing of a 13-year-old Palestinian in Jerusalem, something which was sparsely covered by political influencers. On Ground News, I can see that the story has 74 total sources, and that 31% of the sources lean left and 31% lean right, meaning a pretty bipartisan distribution in terms of who is covering it. I quite like the Bias Insights tab for this story that shows which pieces of the story are being emphasized and which are being left out, depending on political leaning. Ground News also measures factuality at the publication level, based on ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations, as well as the ownership of the sources. Are they independent? Government? I always find these... I, I can't speak to Ground News if it's any good, but I always, I always find... 
these apps a little bit sus in the way that they categorize right, left, and center. Um, because boy, is that like, that is a taken for granted thing, right? Like the, I don't know. What's the standard? Are you using like a political, like the, the six axis politics quiz or whatever it's called? Like, I don't know. Uh, I've never, I do think it's important that people recognize their biases, but also recognize that the, uh, the company that's selling you the ability to see through the biases might very blatantly have its own. I don't know. It's just, just saying. Owned a media conglomerate. Importantly, we can compare headlines from the left and right. Look at the language used between the two headlines here, for example. While the left shares that a 12-year-old boy was killed, the right-leaning headline fails to address that information. Well, there's no such thing as complete objectivity. I will say, that's interesting. That is a very interesting feature. I'll give him that. I think it is interesting to be able to see headlines side by side and look at, at how, how those headlines trend based on broad political leanings. I do think that's interesting. I'll give them credit for that. I do think that Ground News is an effective platform for getting a comprehensive sense of a story as it develops. And I think it offers a corrective to the sort of misinformation that has been discussed. You can subscribe to Ground News through my link in the description, ground.news slash Sisyphus, to get unlimited access to all the features needed in order to better your news consumption habit. Um, and this is through the Vantage subscription for 40% off, which is about $5 a month. This is the plan that I use, and uh, when you subscribe, you not only support me, you're also supporting an independent platform that's trying to make the news a bit more transparent. So I should get I should get sponsorship. I I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that, but maybe. Aside from scarcity, there was also some other feelings that were mentioned. For example, some argued that the online left was lacking in diversity. You know, that there needs to be an engagement with a genuine curiosity about, like, other parts of the world. Um, and it really... Oh, it... sponsor skip. Oh. I know, uh, Uncle Gumbald, I'm so sorry. I cannot do a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship even for Re April Fools. I, I can't do it. It is... It's bad. Goes like in in a lot of different directions like for one i think i see a lot of people assuming that america is like the pinnacle of the worst issues like no other country is going through the kind of issues america is going through right um i mean for one in Trinidad, we have an expression america sneeze and Trinidad catch a cold um so a lot of america's issues just end up being replicated here as well uh, and that goes free for a lot of the caribbean really anywhere that has heavy exposure to american influence which is most of the world um and i understand the focus of conversation on america because america literally is the global superpower but i think there's a lot to be gained from americans engaging outside and vice versa and those that were more outside of the space felt dehumanized and misunderstood it isn't that i want them to change their politics or i want them to uh sort of uh, just like take the knee it's, it's just that I want to be seen as opposed to having things placed onto me having titles labels and explanations placed onto me that in no way fit with how I actually see myself uh, I think that that is one real problem that I see not just with the left but with all politics but I think in terms of the left I'm a lot more critical of the left because okay think... I'm so sorry I have to do this I, I, I have done really well at not doing this, but it's a fucking gigantic irony that you would come on here and complain about people giving you political labels when you regularly argue uh, uh, that trans people should not care about their fucking essential gender identity uh, uh, being imposed on them by other people. Just a fucking really goddamn rich to me. It's, that's... That's rich. That's that's motherfucking rich. Maybe, maybe consider a little bit more understanding towards trans people having 
and it, having society, family members, etc., deeply pressure them to behave and identify a certain way, forcibly making them, uh, forcibly forcing the wrong uh, pronouns onto them. Maybe have a little bit of empathy for that if you don't like the idea of people prescribing a political label that you don't agree with. Just maybe. Okay, all right, I'm done. I broke, I, I broke once, okay, one time. I'm sorry, that was just too fucking rich to me. I think there's a lot more room and sort right. of the uh, okay. ideals for um, society to be better, to sort of progress, to sort of um, and yes, better- And yeah, I acknowledge that is not, that is not relevant to the video overall, but still. Comes uh, to understand sort of a plethora of the human experience. And so there's a lot more potential for the kind of understanding that I sort of would demand. Now, despite these negative feelings, many that have engaged in the online left feel generally satisfied with their work. From this, I got the sense that the online left has definitely shown some level of organizational and educational potential. And yet for many, they still feel like there's work needed. Tonight, we renew our resolve that America will never be a socialist country. Is this guy seriously saying that I can't get laid? Incredible, I'll give you 5,000 if you can get Poontang before January 1st. Do you have any idea who the f you're talking to? When I got off, tin when I got off Tinder because of the f quarantine, Tacoma wept. In incredible. B -b 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 Bazinga. Next, I asked them what they needed to feel satisfied and hopefully have some of these more negative feelings quelled. One of the most common needs was simply to see some action in the form of prefigurative politics and pragmatism. I, I feel as though, you know, for all the talk about, you know, from significant segments of the space about, you know, wanting to see revolution, wanting to see socialism, communism, whatever, this, this is sort of millenarian evangelical Christian approach to it where it's just, oh, you know, someday the second coming of Marx will usher in the revolution or the new age, whatever. We just need to wait and well, I'm not saying that people actually say that that's a I guess a straw man approach to it, but and I'm speaking from an anarchist perspective, of course, but I don't think there's not enough engagement with the actual prefigurative politics, the actual building of a new world in the shell of the old that will be necessary for any sort of revolution to succeed. There's a kind of perfectionism that becomes the enemy of doing anything at all, where it's like, okay, no politician's ever good enough, right? I, I mean, I think of it as sort of utopian, where you kind of are hoping for this imagined future that you imagine will come after the revolution and it's like well you know politics is about power at the end of the day who like what are the realistic pathways to power and like what what people are those available to and like you know you have to like have leaders and you have to get behind them and you have to acknowledge that you know some a lot of them are not going to be exactly the type of socialist you want them to be or or whatever right so i think that uh yeah there, there's a kind of pragmatic dimension to politics that's not um not always captured in that kind of like yearning for a better future. I think what I'm trying to strive for- I hate the word pragmatism. You guys know that. I complain about the word pragmatism all the time because uh, what is pragma pragmatic is not always what is what seems immediately the easiest path. Uh, uh, to give, I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a perfect example, like an example of this, but but sometimes the most pragmatic tactic is the pragma is the tactic that you do not even know about yet. The most pragmatic tactic uh, uh, may not always be uh, slow and steady. Uh, the most pragmatic tactic, what is pragmatic to an end, varies drastically depending on the problem at hand. So I I, I hate when I hear the word pragmatic used in politics uh, because and this is I'm not super dogging on uh on on contra points here um i hear this all frequently it, it's this is a problem i've had with lots of uh political commentaries people use pragmatic as a sort of uh fill-in word for uh it's like it's a good it's like the good thing the 
pragmatic thing, but it's like pragmatism is not always a given. What is pragmatic is highly dependent on the context. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue. For with the canvassing stuff is the idea that you have to stress modes of engagement that are non-adversarial by nature. The progressive victory stuff, for example, doesn't like really serve to benefit me or anyone. I mean, it does maybe like for attention, like you can say, oh, you know, I helped so-and-so with the canvassing, but generally speaking, it's not as beneficial to the bottom line metrics as like putting out a video would be, which directly, you know, it, it sort of enriches me through monetization. By hamping on the non-adversarial -adver stuff, you have the ability to, um, I guess, promote positive engagement in ways you wouldn't get out otherwise. But even then, this is a tough sell for a lot of online lefties, you know? Go and canvas for Democrats? I mean, to a lot of these people, it's like you're asking them to, you know, watch their wife get in front of them. They don't want to be pro-Biden warriors, fun as it might be. I, I have so much trouble getting people to move in the direction of pragmatism in this space. You know, they think it's cuckoldry. Okay, well, good thing I made my piece, made, good thing I said my thing about pragmatism, right? Anyway. But first, there was the need to express the- Pragmatism is a word that people use like common sense. And what it means is what I think is good versus what you think is good. But it, it, it like l it lends false credence. It's like, you know, it's just common sense that what I'm saying is what I think is correct. And it's just common sense. What you think you're saying is not the common sense. I, I just, I don't like the term. It's, it's an empty word for me. And I hear it constantly in political spaces and it drives me up a wall. Even people that I really like say it all the time. It's, it's, it is so subjective. What is the most pra pragmatic approach? Like, I don't know. Pra pragmatism is, 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 it's a fraught term. You, you, nobody agrees on what is the most pragmatic. Okay, anti-electoralist uh, anti lefties believe they're being pragmatic, okay? Those lefties who go out there and say, I'm not gonna vote, they think that is the best path to get what they want. They think they're being pragmatic. So everybody thinks they're being pragmatic. Just like, you know, everybody thinks they're good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, let's continue. Potential for real change that the online left supposedly harbors. Yeah, because I, I, I see what most of what we do as art. Art or education. And both of those have re revolutionary uh, potential. I like to think of myself as both. Ashmar says, Demon Mama, it seems like you're saying that uh, people use pragmatism to mean we should only attempt what I think is achievable. Yes. Everybody has their own standard for what they think is the most achievable path. Um, but it's used in a sort of condescending manner to say, oh, you're, you don't, uh, you know, it, it's used to like grant credence to the idea that like, and with, it, there's no argument in it. When you say that's not pragmatic, you're just saying, I don't think that's the best, best path, but you're dressing it up with this term that, that seems to imply, oh, well, you know, like you, you're just, you know, you, you're just not thinking about, uh, about the, 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 the functionality of it, you know, because everybody who puts an idea forward does it, you know, because everybody, people love putting ideas forward that they don't think are going to work. You know, my favorite thing is logging on the internet and, and advocating for an idea that I think that won't work, that's the least effective path forward. No, obviously everyone thinks that their idea is the most pragmatic one. That everybody thinks that otherwise they would be pursuing a different idea. I don't know, it's, it's, it's silly. It's silly. Uh, and you, depending on the moment, one or the other, but most of the time, both at the same time. I can uh, I can put the initiative, the good cause in the description, um, and I can talk about it in my video, but in the day, only so many people will, will click it, but that is more than who would have if I, if I didn't have a platform, right? And then I can introduce people to ideas. Those ideas will affect the way they engage with and view the world. I can inspire people with a turn of phrase or a, a manipulative 
uh, camera trick slash, you know, swell of music. You know, to me, some people will really only be invested when they see a, a proof of concept. And so we need to be laying out that foundation and showing some semblance of a plan from now. Like there's there's a lot of talk about dialogue and convincing people and almost like converting people as if it's some sort of religion. Oh, uh, and, and to me, to that I say, really, some people are only going to be converted when you go out there and show them, oh, you know, a library economy is possible, or oh, you know, mutual aid can meet people's needs, or oh, you know, this is the potential of a tenants union union or a students union or a workers union to really accomplish certain goals. Uh, and for some people that push uh, the Marxist idea, at least try to introduce people to the Marxist idea and sometimes uh, even change their minds on particular aspects of it. Uh, the main point at the end of the day for us as people who, you know, are, we talk about this with Kakim and JT many times, the, the poster makers of today, is if we end up actually influencing people to get organized. That's what I see as, you know, the end of my marketing funnel of, of what I'm kind of doing. So if they do get organized, my alienation uh, lowers. Unfortunately, I don't have data to back this up and mm -hmm. so on. The only way to show this potential for many was to bring hope to the audience and other creators. A prominent need was an ending a sense of doomerism or hopelessness. Yes, there are these bad faith actors. There are also a lot of good faith actors who are sometimes hurtful or uh, uh, destructive, maybe. Or, or just have an absence of, of constructive input. But it's because they're scared and confused and they don't have the language to express something. And I've always mm. felt that that my content was in its in its beginning and its in its spirit just a message to people like that to try to to get them to understand the feelings that they were having. If we're talking tendencies here, a lot of them are young, a lot of them are very politically disaffected. They feel helpless and powerless. A lot of them are probably much worse off than I am, economically and socially. And they direct their powerlessness towards a small online social space where they can um, feel like an insider by sharing the opinions of others on, on social issues, like their opinions towards me. Again, like I don't want to like patronize or whatever, but I do think that really sucks. And I, I guess I just hope that through me or through some other mechanism, they're able to engage with this stuff in a more healthy way. Like, if they could phone bank or canvas or something with a quarter of the passion they have towards disliking me, not only would they get more done, like, in a real politics sense, but I feel like it'd be a lot better for them, emotionally. That's all I want. This hints at Sartre's notion of group praxis. Instead of working in a state of seriality, individuals temporarily suspend their scarcity mentality and work together on some sort of agreed-upon goal. This doesn't mean they need to be unified or become friends or even agree on most things. It simply involves setting aside differences in recognition that there are some goals that are more easily achieved in collaboration. The online left might disagree on a wide range of issues, but certain overarching goals such as unionization, justice reform, and greater healthcare access could be targets for temporary and practical collaboration. Being okay with having other people talk about the same things as you, maybe bringing a new perspective and not be too like, oh, this is my topic, this is, I'm supposed to talk about it and I'm going to do it best than this or that person, you know. Um, so maybe there's a little bit of that, um, that, that plays into, yeah, why there isn't enough dialogue. There's also maybe, again, like more practical constraints of, organizing interviews, uh, you know, meeting each other, because a lot of us do also have activities outside of YouTube. So I know sometimes it can be a bit challenging. Um, I guess there's a little bit of laziness as well, like we have to admit it. Um, I think that we are always going to have our different opinions. Streamers are always going to have their different opinions. They're always going to, to some degree, clash with each other over those opinions. But what really matters is if that is getting in the way of productive work happening. And what we found is that it's not. Um, we found that we're able to have a broad, you know, coalition, um, big sort of a big tent, you know, movement and, uh, you know, our partners can come in and work with us. You know, if you don't want to uh, be involved with one of the other streamers that we're partnering with, that's okay, that's fine. You know, um, but they 
are uh, aligned with us on the progressive ideals that we want to see come about. They send their audience to us and we get the work done. You know, um, I think you're kind of referencing our um, big event uh, with having Vosh and Destiny come together. And we saw a lot of, you know, um, a large influx of volunteers coming in from that. So, you know, this sort of drama or infighting that, that I think gets a lot of times painted as the boogeyman, you know, it can be turned into positive action. However, to do this involves achieving several other difficult needs. For one, it requires greater humility and inclusivity. I think we do ourselves a benefit to like be real about our limitations and also to recognize like, this is something I've encountered, like not to be a, a defender of the content creators, you know, I mean, like we're, we're, we're mostly artists and stuff like that, like artisty types. Um, but like, sometimes I feel like there's a little bit of a, there's like too high expectations put um, by some people on like what a YouTuber is supposed to be able to do about things. And I'm not saying that's like, you know, oh, you know, get off my ass about everything, don't criticize me. But also, it's kind of crazy sometimes the way that I see people talk on social media. This is especially common on Twitter where things get out of really out of hand, in my opinion. But where people look at a creator and it's like they want, um, it's like they want that person to be a revolutionary leader in and of themselves. And I'm like, that's just not possible. Like you're mm -hmm. you're projecting something onto somebody who can't be that. And finally, don't take this shit too seriously. You're on the you're, you're like online. If you're on Discord or Twitter or YouTube, whatever, it, it's this is not this is not real life. Okay, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take the work you do too seriously. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the very best you can hope to be uh, is uh, a guy who puts up a poster on a wall, essentially. That's the very best that you're, you're gonna get across. Many argue that this also requires a greater sense of responsibility with one's platform. And I've talked to my friend Doe about having this exact- Doe men uh, do mentioned, Doe mentioned. Uh, struggle, um, where, you know, we can feel like no matter how hard we try, we're just not making ourselves understood. Um, and it's dialectical. I'm going to start using that word more and more. It's dialectical. You see, you can blame other people. You absolutely can. And then you have to improve. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's you know, it's, it's perfectly fine to be like, ah, that person, you know, if they were thinking harder, they would understand me. Uh, and nevertheless, it is, it, is, uh, it is on me because nobody else can put my words into my mouth and nobody else can think my thoughts for me. It's actually, uh, it's on me to do those things so i i nevertheless yeah. have to do that for myself um the first and foremost thing is a willingness to be to, to educate oneself and to be educated on topics that they speak about if somebody speaks out of their ass about something um then this is a person that shouldn't be listened to furthermore if uh, they make an honest mistake and you bring it to their attention and they're combative about it or uh they refuse to properly learn or they're incredibly lazy about the resources that they reach out to if they go up and they look up a wikipedia article and skim like a third of it and then pretend that they're uh, educated about it after the after the fact um this is not a sincere person there's so much misinformation i say I, I really care about this issue there's so much misinformation online it'd be helpful if i could have my own documented instances that i could show people in the space to be like look not only have i seen this here's video of me seeing this targeting of aid workers is a real crime and it's really is happening which we documented in here uh documented civilian targeting in in Mikolaev. um so i think having that kind of primary sources is important not only for hopefully creating a better dialogue in the space. We often have conversations in the space without the people affected directly by the topics we're talking about included. And in homelessness, you know, we all kind of in the United States have someone or have some connection to that in some way or know something about it. Whereas when we're talking about a war halfway across the world, um, there's so little firsthand experience. And in many instances, the people talking about the countries and at the start, me included, who have never been to these countries before, have never tried to learn the language or, or you know, meet these people or have many friends in this country. And so that leads to, especially if you're motivated to get content out as quickly as possible, making a lot of sometimes quick mistakes. It also requires an impulse towards community building and from this greater connection and communication. For me, it's important to look at sort of more perspectives and to see the value in different perspectives and what or why certain people have perspectives 
and to not necessarily demonize them or moralize them for having those perspectives, but to try to understand. Um, because I think that is ultimately the only way that we can move forward in time uh, and also in politics. Um, you're not just going to sort of be able to ignore the other side or those you disagree with in this brave new world that you envisage. Through this medium, it's it's about communication. Like it's about really engaging um, with the outside world. And, and yeah, I've been feeling that a lot more lately of, of like anti-capitalist echo chambers um, or just leftist echo chambers. There's never really any platform incentive to engage outside of you know Shapiro reactions or whatever and there's a set set aside formula for that but um I don't know it just feels like lately there's been shortcomings in that communication and and I don't know I've, I for sure contributed to it I've done some videos that I that I like obviously would I think everyone has those videos they'd want to do differently if they did them over it would be so cool if like um users could themselves recommend um, content, you know, be like, oh, you should watch this. And then maybe if multiple people can recommend the same video, it's like it creates a sort of conversation. It's like, oh, this concept you've talked about, then this person connected it to this or that, instead of just basing that on um, keywords. I'm always reminding my fans to like, hey, connect with each other in a real way. When you go and hang out on the Discord, go there with the intention of like, of, of recognizing that you're meeting another person and you might connect with that person and be able to build an actual friendship. Obviously, uh, you have to be careful about like the the streamer, YouTuber, parasocial effect, and that's why I try to correct, like, point people. Don't just try and like. You could be a fan of my work. I obviously love that and appreciate that. And obviously, this is a very interactive platform. But but. I always want to be reminding people that you're here to be able to connect with other people who are interested in the same subjects. We, we've all come here for the same general cloud of reasons. And I'm trans, I talk about trans stuff a lot, and this is super important in the trans community where uh, trans people are kind of spread all over the place, um, you know, so, uh, and some of us live in really dangerous places. So building connections like that means that you might be able to get out of a place because you have a support network now that you didn't have before. Of course, these are just needs. How can we practically strive for this sense of hope? Finally, I asked about specific requests each interviewee had in terms of the online left. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. Maybe calling people pedos, cucks, and purposes if in response to pushback isn't, isn't a great thing. For my discussions, I found four general requests that I think map on closely with these needs. Firstly, many creators suggested a more deliberate and disciplined engagement with the drama and infighting. You know, it, it, if if you've got your your sheep in your your little I don't know what do they what they keep sheep in like a little barn I guess, and then half of them are wolves. In the more a paddock, right? I believe is the word. A paddock. A small field or enclosure where horses are kept. Ah, maybe that's only for horses. I thought it was for sheep also. Pasture, I guess. What is that? I want to know what it, the word is now. A pen? I feel a paddock works. Anyway, let's continue. Morning, you come back and you have you just have wolves. You know, as for for every for every great left wing organization that is that is strictly a group of people who are trying to to radically improve the world and make it better, you also have groups that are full of uh, predators and and victimizers and 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 I don't thieves and scammers and all kinds of other groups of people, and so you know, as much as on the one hand it might seem to undermine the long term goal, maybe in a way resolving this is constructive to the long. -term. Hypno Amber asks, do you have to have a membership to get into the Discord? I, I want to work on talking to people more often. No, you can join the Demon Mama Discord right now. Discord.gg forward slash Demon Mama. We have a super easy click by click onboarding process and we welcome you. I have not been plugging the Discord as much as I should lately, uh, but this is as great of an opportunity as anywhere. We have a super active community. 
It is basically always active to some degree. The tone of conversations is fantastic. And of course, it is a place where people are encouraged to truly connect with each other and hopefully connect beyond just the space itself to make real connections that can strengthen our, our broad network uh, together. So discord.gg forward slash demon mama. We would love to see you in there your term goal as long as it doesn't distract away from it any sort of drama bullshit easy to drop it don't fucking you know like if you have nothing good to say don't say it at all um don't start stuff with other people focus on the education aspect now of course there are certain creators that don't care for this they don't want to just educate they want to you know um <laughs> debate let's say uh, or other types of nonsense like this they just want to create as much clout around them as possible so that they can you know i don't get twitch donations or some shit when when there when something like crops up in that line or i have a disagreement with what i consider to be reactionary ideology i never frame it as or think of it as like the left has gone too far I, I frame it as like, well, this is reactionary ideology. And I think that difference is critical because if you frame it in that way, you don't run the risk of having a group of audience members who think that I'm like one of the good lefties by being willing to quote, call out that bullshit on their side. There's always a big risk and you know you're in trouble when this happens, which is which is when like, if, if you correctly criticize a person on the left and then you see a bunch of conservatives being like, hey, 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 based, you know, you've got them. And it's like, whoa, you know, um, I, you, you're worse, you know, get away from me. So a good way to avoid that is to like not frame it as internal, like internal fighting or like infighting or whatever, but rather as like an identification of these tendencies. But you also have to compensate by appropriately framing these issues. We stick to the receipts. We don't jump into speculation. If we're going, if we're speculating on something, we need to be very clear about that so people don't run with it. Um, and we should avoid doing it altogether. We should stick with the evidence that's available. Uh, we should try to be as charitable as possible to all people involved, and we should avoid rushing to conclusions um, on basically anything. And that's what I try to encourage um, to make the infighting that is going to happen no matter what um, happen in a more productive and effective manner. But like, I think that we should try to avoid being uh, lethal to one another in our infighting and we should instead try to encourage people actually engaging with one another and growing. And obviously there are going to be times where you have to draw lines and say, this is unacceptable, but uh, when it comes to like political disagreements, I think that we should we should try to recognize that like part of the value of the left is that we can disagree with one another, is that there is a lot more of a liberatory focus, which means people are gonna come to different conclusions and we should be able to uh, work together uh, to, to the best of our ability to disagree uh, r rationally. <laughs> One potential way to figure out this line between filtering out bad actors and still communicating and collaborating with other people in the space can be found in the tit-for-tat strategy in game theory. Game theory relates to the science and math behind strategies and interactions. In one experiment called the Generalized Prisoner's Dilemma, two agents must decide whether to cooperate or defect in order to score the most points. If Agent 1 cooperates and Agent 2 follows, both get 3 points. If Agent 1 defects while well, Agent 2 cooperates and vice versa, the agent that defected gets 5 points and the agent that cooperated gets nothing. If both defect, both agents get 1 point. Out of all of the strategies implemented in this game, one named Tit for Tat was seen as the most successful given that the amount of rounds are unknown or infinite. In Tit for Tat, the agent first cooperates and then copies the following response from the other. If Tit for Tat cooperates and then the other strategy does so as well, Tit for Tat will continue to cooperate. But if suddenly the other strategy defects, Tit for Tat will defect as well until the other strategy decides to cooperate again. The idea is that the strategy is cooperative, nice, and forgiving, but ultimately still provocable and therefore not a pushover as in willing to cooperate but not afraid to defect based on the response. Although I would argue that this tit-for-tat strategy would be useful for online creators in determining whether the person they're deciding to collaborate with is in bad faith or not, um, it still doesn't quite confront the dilemma of audience expectations and the love of drama that fuels views. But some audiences only turn up for the drama. Some audiences only turn up for the takedown video. Um, and if, if I think if everyone made a more concerted effort 
to be more honest about what that is, then we would have just that much less toxicity and that much more energy for when it's time to make a move, when it, when you can funnel your audience to good things. However, this isn't always easy. Unfortunately, you know, that stuff is not the, 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 the algorithm's not tuned into it. If the algorithm's not tuned into it, it's really because the audience isn't tuned into it, right? And so we have to train our audience or retrain our audience to be more into that. That it's, uh, it, it can be sometimes pretty difficult, I feel, to balance the, to balance the desire to coalition build with the desire to engage in internal critique. There is a lot of really dumb shit that gets said in the um, online left. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's worthwhile to push back against it sometimes. So doing that while maintaining, like, a generally positive attitude, that's pretty tough. People- Oh, holy shit. That, that big monster appearing in his game, like, immediately just, it scared me just enough. Like, I'm not playing Prey right now, but my memories of Prey- and that giant monster coming in, that part was so scary in Prey where you're getting stalked by the big monster. Woo! Oh, yeah. Nasty points out, the latest drama video you put out had a lot of views, even though it was the most blatant bait ever created. We literally put a worm on a hook. I should say, Nasty literally put a worm on the hook in the... In the gigantic in the thumbnail the thumbnail is a worm on a hook and uh and my video is the most generically titled drama bait title ever and the video opens with me saying that uh, uh drama frogs are like pigs to slop and i want to feed them the most pathetic garbage ever and wouldn't you goddamn believe it not only did it get a lot of a lot of views but also, there were a ton of people in the comments angry that I didn't address the drama correctly or they were confused as to what drama I was talking about. That right there is the kind of thing that uh, it, it proves my point so hard. It's just like I can sit back and smugly uh, grin like, uh, like George Lucas. Uh, climbing out of his car with his little aviators doing this little smile like that's me when I see that when I see the fucking Comments of people being like what the fuck? I don't understand what drama are you talking about and shit like oh Demon mama didn't address the drama well enough in a video in which I'm quite literally like going like this and going Screw you. It's incredible It's amazing it's a mega flex, by the way, and it definitely, definitely doesn't feed my god complex in a way that could be very bad if I didn't have it in check. Well, uh, people take stuff real personal, you know? You don't, clearly. You're willing to talk to me, and, and I, was, I was quite mean to you. On a similar note, many creators voice the need for responsible content and understand that at the end of the day, they do have influence. Merely declaring yourself as an entertainer, while certainly valid, does not omit you from taking your platform seriously. You know, I, I think the potential you mentioned Hassan, for somebody like Hassan to do something like that, to get people uh, on the right page, there's there's a great potential and it's it's also a, a Uncle Ben Peter Parker situation where with great power comes a certain, maybe not, maybe not an outsized degree of responsibility, but a certain degree of, of uh, rhetorical responsibility. Be more uh, careful when interacting with breaking news. We all, uh, social media is a bubble and we all, whether we admit to it or not, end up getting our news from social media in some way or another. Even if it just means we see a headline on social media and then we go research it ourselves. And social media is gonna serve us what it thinks we want to see. And so if there's a new story that falls within our particular narrative uh, that's being reported on, on by news stations that we particularly like, uh, it is important to wait to see what other news stations report on and just give it the time necessary for a story to develop. Definitely when we're talking about things like terrorism, definitely when we're talking about things like war, definitely when we're talking about things like any type of shooting or bombing. You know, everybody that is going to watch a video of an undertaker is not going to turn immediately into 
uh, a sexist person or a misogynist. You know, it's like it's 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 more complex than that. So I feel like it's also our job to, you know, just not fall for basically what the trap, not fall in the traps because like the traps are there. They make that content specifically because they want us to react to it and so give a platform, etc. And I feel like yeah, there's a balance to 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 be found there between using them for attention uh, to bring a different message. Uh, which is what I try to do and what I encourage other people to do as well. And then just like, you know, like using this just for, for clout and then to, to to do something that is purely reactionary but doesn't really bring any additional value, if you, if you see what I mean. I really want people to push themselves beyond the aesthetics and language of anti-capitalism and dig more into the substance of it. I see a lot of people just they see a piece of media or they see a figure say something that sounds even madly anti-capitalist and it just becomes this it's overstated in my opinion on the creator side really try to amplify solutions amplify and connect to you know some of the modern struggles and really try to learn from the mistakes of history um you know it's said that history doesn't repeat but it often rhymes and you really see a lot of historical trends just repeating themselves because people didn't learn from Okay, that this is this is the biggest brainworm ever. But every time I hear that quote, you know, history doesn't repeat but it rhymes, I my brain plays in my head involuntarily the video of George Lucas being like, you know, you know, it's like poetry. It rhymes. From them. So, for example, the democratic socialist slash social democracy crowd, that sort of trend of, you know, well, we'll do this electoral means and eventually we'll achieve other ends later on, was the same sort of approach that was taken, you know, in the early, early 20th century. And a lot of those European social democracies really just slipped right into capitalism um, in the end. I think if people just read anything, just read more, uh, you don't have to be an expert to be able to be in these conversations, but I don't think you're going to meaningfully become educated on a topic or enter any meaningful discussion if you're just like reading a headline. Yeah, so it's not just like, you know, academics know everything, but like at least that's one avenue in which you can explore these different lifelong conversations or if you want to find that somewhere else like an activist space or an activist archive that's also a place where there's been ongoing conversations and discussions that are valuable to learn about so i mean you can choose your sources but um not don't just like choose random shit like choose established humans coming together communicating making ideas together in a way where they're like holding each other accountable most creators also suggested direct action as a request for others. The first thing that came to my mind was offline action, but that's just something that I've been about, which doesn't necessarily mean you literally have to leave your house, although if you're able to, you should. That can be calling folks, that can be organizing meetings or whatever. Like there are so many different ways to show up uh, for the politics that you care about, and I just think those are maybe the needs of the audience. Like I, I would caution and, and try to encourage my, not caution, and try to encourage my audience to show up for more things instead of just talking about them online because I think online spaces should be a place where you learn, where you start to grow, where you start to develop your ideas 100%. But I'm very aware of the fact that it can only take you so far. Contribute to direct aid which is something I have seen people do it. And I've participated in this myself quite a lot, but, and I've seen it and I've done it with other creators. So it's not like no one's doing it, but they are like, there is an ability for uh, streamers, given that we, we as streamers and YouTubers too, because YouTubers also will tend to cultivate mods and you tend to have a discord. These things are sort of natural to how we build our platforms anyway. We can use that to be able to go, okay, wait, there's people in our community who have needs. Um, and maybe we can meet those needs. 
um, you know, instead of just doing like a single charity run for a for a specific charity, a Tiltify thing or whatever, um, maybe we can engage in direct aid and and immediately impact people who are in need right now for whatever reason. Or on the next level, if you're not like looking to to do you know really small scale stuff, maybe there are organizations that aren't getting the attention that they need that that through these types of very organic community building that we do, we can find and channel that energy into, and it can make a really big difference. If nothing else, direct action can allow creators to practice that group praxis and understand their similarities and commonalities. I used to do charity streams more often. I want to get back into that. Like you raise, I raised like 300K for Palestinian children. Um, and I saw there were people online where it's like, oh, well, you know, maybe you hate the guy, but you got to give him credit for that. Pretty, pretty difficult to hate a person off of a headline like that. And then, and then that's kind of like an opening line, you know what I mean? Where, where, where you can you can be like, okay, well, despite our many personal disagreements, or despite like this or that, the other, clearly there's something we care about together. You know, we don't like Gaza being bombed in dust. So let's like let's let's put a pin in this. Maybe we hate each other, sure, but can we work together on, I don't know, raising funds for crap like this, or at least indicating we're willing to do stuff like that? And if you can, then that's kind of the problem fixed, right? Because you don't need to be friends with people. You just need to be able to work together for shared political expediency. Finally, and as exemplified in this very video, communication and connection was crucial in uh, satisfying the needs of various left-leaning voices. Whether this meant platforming marginalized voices, reaching across the aisle, or actually just listening to each other, most of those interviewed requested some level of greater communication. So I think it's important for me to be seen uh, and to sort of inadvertently um, make sure that other people feel seen as well. Um, I get that sense from a lot of comments that I get on my videos. At a baseline, just, just honest and continuous engagement with not just like regressive politics, but like, or regressive creator circles even, but like, honestly, with the center, with like this kind of like, Kidology, Abba and Preach, like Destiny, these major creators, um, there is this echo chamber feeling where I'm anytime interactions happen, even though obviously like, some of these people are just pieces of shit. And some of these people like, it, it, it makes sense as to like, given the history and given the lore, why you wouldn't want to engage, honestly. When you're talking about countries, do your best to make sure that voices from those countries are involved in talking about those countries. Um, and I don't mean it just because like, yay, representation is cool. I mean it because there's a decent chance that your interaction with this country is 24 hours old and their interaction with this country is for 25 years. And there's just certain things you pick up from living there, especially if you're studying there as a scholar, it's even better if you can get experts on the issue. I've really come to value even like the stupid disagreements that I have with people. Uh, on the internet because there's so much to learn um you know i mean i've yelled at vosh about things before but i value that that he has he he's not a big uh bridge burner guy himself and uh i like that about him and i like the the willingness to have the conversation there's something about that 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 is uh very valuable to me so i i do appreciate you um reaching out about this well, not to be all like bob dylan about it but there's something happening here uh, there's there's a something going on in this space. There's a changing a changing consciousness, and it's it's always in flux. What that was all about? Uh, the revolution will not be televised. That was about the fact that the first change that takes place is in your mind. You have to change your mind before you change the way you live and the, and the way you move. So when we said that the revolution will not be televised, we were saying that like that that that. that, that Here is a fairly convoluted flowchart that I made to help organize the thoughts that were expressed in this video. Firstly, I asked what others observe about the online left. To do this is to first define leftism in general, which could be easily a whole other video. 
I felt in general that this sentiment of anti-capitalism and the America-centric view of the left being anything left of Obama both adequately described the left. There was also a clear division between those who felt that the left should not engage in electoral politics and those who felt that leftism should maintain some relationship with electoralism. This was a pretty constant divide. However, as pointed out by some, unity around these issues might not matter as much as focusing on what sort of things people generally agree on. Then we moved on to what the online left is considered to be, which appears to be a cultural institution of the left more broadly. Firstly, there is an apparent interaction between real-world politics and the online left, as exemplified by its influence on both elections and in agitating and educating those who may not have access to such knowledge. In terms of what the online left actually is, the space appears to be an externally imposed identity placed on certain influencers and creators who fit into the generally defined criteria of being leftist. This is a reality of digital spaces, in that identity is often formed in a dynamic between the audience and creator. In turn, creators may cover certain topics and operate in a way that is informed more so by their audience expectations and optics than by their own authentic motives. This is a direct example of profile politics, where one's political identity is informed by second-order behavior. Being clumped into the leftist space may nudge you into embracing more leftist values. There is also an observable contradiction in the space. As a result of its anti-capitalist message, the online left must contend with the fact that the space relies on capitalism in order to spread its message of anti-capitalism. Specifically, the livelihood of the creators is inherently tied to the attention economy. This, in turn, influences content. A final observation is that the online left functions as a social space more so than a political space or place for coalition building. Like any space, political or social, this can lead to infighting and drama. Next, I asked how people felt about the online left. Most creators voiced some level of satisfaction in the space, with some arguing that the democratization of knowledge, community building, and real-world influence emergent in the online left has led to a rejuvenation of leftism in general. However, there was also some negative feelings surrounding the space that were mostly concerned with how these creators saw themselves as well as the content they made. On the identity side, many creators felt that those within the space take themselves far too seriously. Amassing such a large audience that endorses most of your views could inflate your ego while making you overly concerned with optics. As a result, creators could experience a sense of isolation and paranoia due to an over-concern with constantly appearing optically good in the eyes of their audience. Regarding the content that is being made, creators noted a sense of scarcity in terms of attaining views and covering topics. This can result in creators rushing their content, thereby decreasing its quality, as well as feelings of alienation with their own work, as what they decide to cover may be more often than not dictated by what drives traffic or what larger creators are covering. These concerns with identity and content can then result in a general lack of direction for the online left, with most creators striving for the same goal, a goal being a mix of genuinely spreading leftist ideology and amassing a larger audience, many shared a sense of squandered potential. As a result, there was a general feeling of pessimism in the space. A potentially useful space was being threatened by audience capture and capital. If pessimism was the general feeling shared across the online left, then hope was the shared need. Some creators voiced a general wish to see the space become a place for the disillusioned and hopeless to recognize their own capacity for change and action. This hope was possible under the satisfaction of three smaller needs, action, connection, and ethics. Firstly, creators wished to see more direct action as a way to exemplify the real-world impact of the space. This is already apparent in the real-life examples in both electoral and non-electoral politics. Secondly, there was a push for greater connection in terms of community building and communication. A combination of action and connection could result in group praxis, where those engaging with the online left can temporarily open barriers of communication in order to collectively strive towards a common goal. Of course, this would require some consistent ethical code. From the interviews, there are three ethical norms that have been endorsed. Firstly, there is the need for greater humility. Creators should not take themselves too seriously and should be willing to admit when they are wrong or have wronged someone in some way. Secondly, creators should recognize that their influence means that they should responsibly curate content to avoid misinformation and the spread of harassment. Finally, inclusivity would require a greater appreciation for the voices of others and the simple understanding that sometimes people know better than you about a specific topic at hand. This means including those from groups that have been historically silenced, as well as reaching out to those immediately impacted by whatever you're talking about. 
From these needs of action, connection, and ethics, the interviewees suggested specific requests to fulfill the general goal of increasing hope. In terms of action, there was a simple call for prefigurative politics and greater pragmatism. Instead of waiting around for some sort of revolution to occur, we should do what we can with what we have, and direct audiences to direct aid and offline action. Regarding connection, this means being a creator who amplifies solutions rather than takedowns. This also means a more disciplined engagement with drama by recognizing that disagreements are natural and could even be productive. Si I think I was the only person interviewed who talked about direct aid. Hmm. Simultaneously, responsibly engaging with drama means training the audience to be less reactive and attracted to such content. In terms of ethics, humility will hopefully come as a result of productive infighting where being publicly wrong about things is treated with higher regard. Responsibility will be cultivated through better research and engaging less with so-called bad faith actors. And inclusivity should emerge through covering non-American topics as well as through platforming marginalized and impacted voices that are relevant to a specific topic as well as reaching across the aisle. Overall, it is through direct action, greater connection, and an ethics based on inclusivity, humility, and responsibility in which the online left could bring hope to its audience and other- We are in the last uh, approximately 10 to 15 minutes of the video. We are in the very last stretch of the video for everyone there. And, I, I, and then I will plan on discussing this a little bit afterwards. The creators well combating- the Yeah, I've done pretty goddamn well in not over-pausing. I wanted to give this video room to breathe with some commentary, and then I'm going to give my reflections on it afterwards, so. Pessimism that is emergent in a space threatened by the re-territorialization of capital. Or that's what I gathered from talking to these people anyways. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a little theorizing here. The revolution will not be televised is above all about. Okay, I, I do think it's very funny to put on an Amazon.com Che Guevara t-shirt at the end. A sort of collective desire for change that is difficult to capture on air, let alone in a live stream or a YouTube video. The revolution, a psychic change, this sudden shift in attitude. In the words of Huey Newton, it's this idea that the revolution runs on hope and desire. Desire is a fickle thing. Um, you could call it motivation, the will to power, or even hope. It gets us out of bed in the morning to create beautiful things, to learn about ourselves and the world, and to watch hour-long videos on obscure digital spaces. Now, when united, even temporarily, desire can allow us to imagine and build new worlds of emancipation, of dignity, and compassion. Newton's words ring true. A revolution runs on desire. How could it not? But our desires can also lead us down dark paths, towards destruction and self-destruction. It can bring us to tyranny, depravity, and even obliteration. At its worst, we may even come to desire our own repression. We may end up betraying ourselves along the way, only to look back far too late and wonder what exactly went wrong. This is why I've always appreciated philosophy, as it urges us to examine why we do what we do and who we are at every turn. Now, what does this have to do with the online left? Over the course of this video, I've tried my best to investigate the needs of the online left in a fairly clear and concise manner. The general need expressed by the left um, that I could ascertain was this heightening of consciousness in order to educate and provoke change. It was that hope and desire that the revolution runs on. But the online left, according to a lot of these interviews, is in a bit of a precarious position. This very desire for change is often captured and taken in the opposite direction. Capitalism effectively absorbs any active sources of destabilization into passive sources of wealth. It simultaneously opens up spaces for exploitation, including those which are anti-capitalist, and also captures them so they never destabilize the system too much. Any desire for anti-capitalist subversion is then constrained to a mere interest that fuels profit. 
this is just really hard to avoid. How could we ever possibly create less? One, this is from Anti Oedipus. Uh, one can posit revolution as the objective interest of the masses or the working class and be perfectly. Oh, okay. One can posit revolution as the objective interest of the masses or the working class and be perfectly correct. But the real question is under what circumstances that in, that interest corresponds or to or becomes their desire. And conversely, how that desire can so easily get captured and taken in quite opposite directions. That's what the quote at the bottom says. Commodifiable critiques of commodity. Even Heron gave Nike the rights to use his song in a 1994 sneakers ad, and that whole song was literally about you know, this revolution that's that's going to go beyond commodity, it's going to go beyond mass media. So the success of subversive spaces like the online left in terms of advancing its anti-capitalist agenda is now largely dependent on its success under capitalism. Those within it, in turn, can become increasingly concerned with optics, reputation, and branding, and a lot of the times this is at the expense of creativity, transformation, and collaboration. At its worst, a lot of them can become paranoid. Capitalism is relentless in its paranoid repression of desire. To its members, it warns ominously that we'll always find a place for you within the expanded limits of the system, even if an axiom has to be created just for you. Paranoia follows this logic. In order to perpetuate our existence, we need to ward off mutation and change. Ironically, the more we attempt to define or unify Polymath says, Anti-Oedipus and a Thousand Plateaus are considered pretty much one work, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. This is Deleuze and Guattari's work, which have been refer referenced multiple times here. Polymath says, I've been reading it lately, so it's kind of interesting that you and Doe are, are as well. And Sisyphus has brought it up several times as well. Um, Doe has been reading Deleuze and Guattari for years. Uh, Doe is, it is so well read on Deleuze and Guattari, and I believe it would get mad at me for saying that it's well read on those things, but uh, it is. And I am, I am, I am somewhat familiar with certain concepts, and I am now beginning my journey into reading Deleuze and Guattari. I think there's a lot, there's so much that's incredibly compelling in in uh, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's work that I have found useful, that I have found uh, in. I don't know, ins inspiring. I, don't, I feel like I said that already. But uh, the point is, I don't have any conclusions yet. But I have been, uh, uh, I've found it to be an edifying read so far. Doe knows a lot more about them. And yeah. These subversive spaces, the more easily such spaces end up uh, being kind of subsumed by the status quo or the system. They often become rigid, hierarchical, and inhibited by bureaucracy and internal schisms. I would actually argue that the lack of definition and clear leadership in the online left, as well as the diversity of opinion within it, may actually bolster its ability to avoid subjugation and evade total kind of capitalist capture. Perhaps at its best, pockets of the online left could even assemble to realize their potential for as long as possible without necessarily aspiring for permanence thereby temporarily working together and building connections to instill this broader desire for change. What we have today is an activism that is ideologically sterile. It seems that all we have been doing for a long while now is just directing our efforts to resist the system, which is important work, protesting injustice and all that. But we're also learning that the more we do that, the more we resist the system, the more we seem to assume the shape of the system. There's a dynamic there. The more I use a tool, the more I become a tool to the tool, so to speak, the more I'm used by the tool. We cannot simply continue to depend on that paradigm of resistance singularly. We need a paradigm of renewal. We need a way to attract people into conversations, to make, to make this paradigm shift sexy, so to speak, to bring people into circles and let them heal, let them ask questions, let them explore the world from their own points of view. And I believe once we begin to divert our efforts into these creative forms of enterprise, into these ways of engaging the discourse on social justice, I think new, new things will emerge. 
that was completely take us by surprise. Traits that are inherent to the space, such as the ease of communication, the creativity and diversity within it, and the relative flexibility offered by profilicity, all point to the sort of fluidity needed in such a group. I would actually argue that the ability for the space to evade total definition and unity speaks to its strength against the paranoid elements of capitalism. If anything, the online left is incredibly marketable. It can survive and even thrive under capitalism. The issue then, as expressed by those I interviewed, is the extent to which those within the left can reap the benefits of its marketability while avoiding the paranoia that leads to capitalist repression. How does the online left achieve such a balancing act between unmarketable radicality and being total sellouts? I think that the needs expressed by those I've interviewed offer a pretty good starting point. The online left will likely benefit through temporary zones of direct action and collaboration, fluid networks of communication, and an ethics that values humility, inclusivity, and responsibility. Importantly, however, the implementation of any of these needs requires, firstly, some level of courage at the individual level, to act above and beyond the paranoia that leads to an overconcern with optics. This requires a firm belief that things can and will get better, a sort of hope that may appear absurd or naive to others. Of course, it is beyond the scope of this video to explore whether we can choose what we desire, let alone attempt to define what those desires should manifest as. But I would urge us all to continue to interrogate, reflect, and philosophize over our own choices, needs, and motivations in the hopes of understanding ourselves a little bit better. In doing so, we can hopefully understand when and where our own desires and needs are leading us down paths of flourishing and creativity versus paths of paranoia and repression. Now, without claiming that this video is either a victory lap for or an absolute annihilation of the online left, I'm going to simply end it by saying that this space has done some good and it's done some harm and that it can also do better. And I hope this video helped in clarifying what that better could look like in some small way. Thanks for watching. I know I can't drive a truck. And I can't run a bank. And I can't count. No. And I can't be the and I can't be the movement. But I can fuck up your mind. <laughs>
Bazinga. By the way, nice move. I caught you. You remember the part in the video where it talked about how you got to appeal to the biggest creators in the space, you know, because that's part of the strategy and that's how you, you know, take the step forward. You have to, you have to pay attention to those polls and the profilicity of the creators will be important. Well, uh, I think like one of the largest, if not the largest creator, uh, at least one of the most active communities interviewed there was of course Vosh's community. So, you know, the end animation having a whole bunch of in-jokes directed at Vosh's community. Excellent, excellent way to pay attention to that profilicity. You know what I've learned from this video though? The one, the big overall takeaway that I've learned from this video is that streamers and YouTubers are locked in the torment nexus that uh, we are we are being tortured alive uh, for all of your entertainment and uh, you're all monsters for it. <sighs> all right, let's talk about this video. So um, the revolution will not be uploaded. So boy, there was so much that was touched on in this video. Um, I do think that it's quite telling that basically every single creator uh, with maybe maybe one or two exceptions, but basically every single creator interviewed uh, talked about the strain uh, and the pressure uh, of the content mill. Um, and there was, these are all, pe I mean, there is a, a broad uh, category of people here in this video. That should tell you something about the uh, emotional duress that this, ty that this type of work puts on the people uh, who, who decide to do it uh, and also who manage to make it to any degree. Um, it is a... Uh, and especially when you're making political content, which is not, um, it is it is not loved by algorithms. Uh, it is not loved by any social media platform, um, unless it, it, it unless it is the most broadest appeal or um, a very specific type of conflict-inspiring content. Everything else is. It's rough out there. Um, and also, I think that the fact that people from all over this perspective have a essentially a functionally negative view of the concept of the online left, um, I think that's also very telling. Um, it's, it's, uh, oh, it, there's a, I think we are entering a new era. I think uh, for sure we are entering into a new era. And I am not sure what that new era will, I mean, you can't, you can't read the future, but uh, things are changing on a very fundamental level in how these spaces operate. What was is no longer. And uh, we are in the interstice. Um, I mean, you could argue we're always in an interstice. Uh, there are no real points, you know, in history. There's no A and B in history. Uh, but but we are in a particular period where a lot of people are, are experimenting and recalibrating, recalculating, and, and trying to figure out where they're going to go. And I think a lot of audiences feel similarly. Um, in some ways, this video is an expose. It's an expose on all of us, including Sisyphus, in that uh, all of us put together and interviewed in a fairly constructive manner, uh, we struggle to say anything shocking or jarring or revelatory. 
that a lot of the problems that we're dealing with are nothing new, um, but that the solutions to those problems are truly not as easy as it seems, and also uh, that the uh, expectation out the the expectation formulas are all fucked up. They're all messed up. Um, in some ways, I I really. I feel proud of the things that I said and the way that I talked about it. But in other ways, I wish that I would have been able to articulate myself better. I am proud of myself for being, I think, the only person who directly, not only directly brought up, but explicitly described a broad strategy for how you can use a community to engage in direct aid. I do think that that's something that I feel proud of and that I stood out for in this entire video. Um, that uh, I don't think most people ever think about that in these spaces. And it is one of our biggest boons. The fact that uh, when you build a community and you succeed and you have an infrastructure uh, by which you have mods and trusted community members and you get to know people and whatever, that you have a system by which you can find and direct attention and resources to. And We've done that here, uh, and I've done it in my own life. I uh, regularly pay attention to a fairly, a, a, actually, I shouldn't even say fairly, to a large network of people that I know, uh, and when their needs come to my attention, I am very frequently able to, if not directly contribute myself, get them to the hands of people who are able to contribute. Um, and it's not always something that I do publicly as a part of my show at all, um, outside of, I guess, talking about it in the abstract here. Um, there have been so many occasions where I have been able to, as a result of the, the network effect of having people in my community that I know that know people and, and, and you know, that sort of, because of the signal, you know, because of that, that ability, I've been able to find people in need and help them find people who can help them. Um, and not only that, but this happens autonomously as a result of the c culture that I've established in my community. And I am proud of that. And I'm proud to, I'm proud to have been able to bring that up as a part of this conversation. Um, but it is unfortunate. Um, it is unfortunate how I guess how it, it's painful to witness how lost we all are. Uh, that it is not easy. It is not a clear cut answer um, uh, uh, as to how do you make the world a better place. Um, we've done this to ourselves to a certain degree in, uh, in being, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to even talk about that. Have we? It, there is a, you know, the point that Sisyphus brought up at the end where he talked about the fact that the identity, that there is a, uh, there is a back and forth with an audience as to what you are, whether you're a leftist politics creator or whatever. We've all, to some degree, self-labeled. By being in this video, we have volunteered the, or we have at least accepted to some degree that we label ourselves as lefties and online lefties. The fact that we appeared in this video at all um, says that. But also, what that means is often imposed onto us. Like, when I started, you know, creating content, I didn't set out to be like a, an activist. I wanted to have compelling conversations, and I wanted to get people's minds flowing, and I wanted to learn a lot from engaging with other people. Um, I wanted to grow. But a lot of people, they see somebody start to gain ground and there's all of these expectations that are built on top of it. And some of them, you don't even know. A lot of times you, I mean, quite literally, the vast majority of the time as somebody in my position, you don't even know what the expectations that people have about you are going to be. Then they might never even properly communicate them. You might just get anger at the fact that you are not living up to them. And, yeah, I think it's, 
I think this is a, I, I enjoyed this video a lot and I found it valuable. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it, it alone is going to change the world or anything like that. I don't think it's the most groundbreaking video that's ever been made. Uh, I don't think what I said was the most groundbreaking things that have ever been said. In fact, I think a lot of what I said is fairly obvious um, observations from experience in these spaces. But I do like that this video was able to get so many different people into one screen. Um... And that certain agreements, even across, even across huge ideological differences, were able to be brought forward um, and, and illuminated. And I do think that's very interesting. And uh, I'm trying to think back over all of the different here. We should look at the, uh, at the little, oh, I want to see, is the graph available? I want to see if is there a visible can we see the 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 raw image file for that for that web graph no i guess not i'm going to i'm just going to look through this little web graph and and touch on some of these things um uncle gumbald says demon mama i agree with what fd signifier was saying near the middle of the video that y'all are artists and educators and that shouldn't be dismissed out of hand yeah, um, I, that that's something I've been saying for a really long time too, in a different in different wording. But I really agree with what FD was saying on that particular section. Um, I think I think he was spot on that like most of us are here not because uh, you know we're we're politically passionate artists. We came here because we have some affinity for cameras and lighting or, or audio or animation or whatever. And we want to make a positive change in the world. And we also have, you know, strong feelings about certain subjects and about what is right and, and, and wrong. And, and, uh, but, but we are ultimately artists and, and educators, uh, you know, or edutainers, as I like to call myself, I'm an edutainer. You know, I like to teach people stuff while I, while we have fun. Um, I, I think, hmm, how do I go, how do I talk about that? I wish that we all could make a bigger impact. And by a bigger impact, I mean, sometimes I wish we would all do things slightly differently. And I mean this about myself. And not even slightly differently. I mean, maybe we should make different things. You know, when I look at the streaming world, there is a time, there are times where I sit here and go, there's a lot of creativity and energy. Is streaming doing it? Is it cutting it? Is it actually doing anything at all? And are <laughs> the one thing I will say is that it, it does kind of drive home the point of the idea that streamers are streamers and YouTubers are not having a good time with these with these platforms. We're not having a good time with it. It's rough, you know? And if that's the case, you know, I worry sometimes, you know, that we're being tormented or tortured uh, for the wrong reasons. And that maybe we could make something different and it wouldn't be as bad. But I don't know. I don't know if that's the answer. And I'm not giving up yet. Uh, so I guess the only answer is to keep trying and until the until it's not the time to try anymore. I do think that it was it was cool to distill that we all kind of agree broadly that there is a need for increased, you know, responsibility, inclusivity, and, and Sisyphus used the word humility. I don't know if I would use the word humility necessary, necessarily. I think maybe, I, I don't know, did I, did I use that at the time? I don't know that I did. Maybe I did. I don't know. I don't know that it's humility 100%, but rather, uh, a, a specific type of self-awareness, 
Uh, we're all fairly self-aware people as streamers. You have to be. You cannot be a streamer and not be self-aware constantly. You're putting yourself on camera all the time. It's how it, it's, it is a byproduct. If you aren't when you start streaming, you will become that way. It is what happens when you live in front of a camera. Uh, I mean, hell, um, I, I recall even Vosh in his uh, debate 101 guide that he did a million years ago. This is so long ago. But he talked about how one of the ways that he refines his debates is by imagining himself in the third person. That if he is, he imagines himself as a member of the audience and how he would react to the things that he just said. That is a, a, a type of self-awareness. That's not the type of self-awareness that I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is a, a sense of scope, a recognition of our limitations, a recognition of our strengths, which is very hard to do. But I do think that it's good that everybody can kind of agree that it's important for us to analyze these things. Um, I think I think humility is a term that works fine. I don't know. I, I have, I guess I have some hangups from a religious background about the term humility. You know, um, humility has a uh, has a subjugative context to it that I don't like. But at the same time, it does somewhat fit. It's a recognition that hey. Like the be all end all isn't my community. Uh, and uh, also that that also means that all the pressure isn't necessarily on me. I do think that this video drives home the idea that the online left is far too broad to be collected under a single umbrella. Um, we have a word for it, but that word is fairly nonsensical which is a position I've held for, for quite some time, uh, that we use the word online left only to, bro to like broadly motion to a, uh, a nebula, an immense nebula of people, ideas, groups uh, that sometimes have very little in common uh, and that we should be careful how we invoke it. And I think this video uh, further solidifies my confidence in that analysis. Um, and there was a, there was an aspect of this video that I think, uh, illustrated the limitation of the video, which was the discussion of real world politics of how to get involved offline. And even in this video, even with people who were explicitly representing a, uh, uh, you know, the idea we can get off offline. There were two answers. Well, three. Mine, which is, I think that one of the ways that in this space, what we are as entertainers and community managers, basically, what we can do is we can do this direct aid thing. Then there was another answer, which was get involved broadly. Just, you know, find a political group and get involved. And then third, there was the political group saying, you know, the PV saying, come get involved with us. And uh, I found that online content creators tend to be pretty bad at answering people's, at, at not answering necessarily, but meeting people's concerns and giving satisfying answers as to how to get involved in the real world. Um, my approach to that is, I guess, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit humble. Uh, I don't know. It, it's pretty small. I tell people that what I want them to do, what I want to inspire is, uh, is, is further political introspection, is a, uh, I want to convince people to look around them, the world around them, and keep their eyes peeled in certain ways for people and, and for people specifically, especially that are in need and whether they can meet those needs. And I want to encourage people to socially connect through the avenues that I've created and beyond. But 
that's my focus. You know, I, I don't, I've found that a lot of times there's just sort of a broad deferral to go get involved, but um, I don't find that satisfying. And this is not just me speaking as a creator. I'm one of the smallest creators in this video. You know, I'm a small fry, all things considered. But uh, I never found when I, before I became a creator, when I was listening to people in these spaces, I tried doing some of the things that, that creators recommended. You know, go do this, go do that. And and I didn't find it to, to, to satisfy what I was looking for, what I was reaching for when I wanted to become politically in, involved or empowered. And I think that's a problem that a lot of, well, I guess a lot of lefty content creators struggle with. And uh, I guess part of the reason why I talk about it the way I do is because I acknowledge my limitations. I'm a streamer. If I stream, I don't have time or a lot of time to be spending going and trying out different political orgs so that I can give reviews of political orgs. Uh, maybe there's a content creator out there who can do that, but the most of us can't. And I feel like me just saying go grab onto some political org is, is a pretty piss poor pitch and a dishonest pitch. You know, I'm kind of just shell. When people come to me and say, how do I get involved? If I was to say, oh, you know, go do this. Uh, I don't like that. And also, I don't like the idea of deferring into organizations that might might be manipulative or that might not have people's best interests at heart. There are a lot. Listen, uh, political organizations have a tendency to attract a certain type of, of mentality, a certain type of, of person, a, a certain type of uh, funding, political orgs have a high tendency uh, towards corruption. They have a high tendency towards selling people pies in the sky and taking advantage of their uh, of their labor in order uh, while while selling you a revolution or selling you political change and not delivering the, on that at all. While the people at the top of those organizations sit pretty. And, uh, and so I don't like the idea of blind, blindly recommending people get involved in, in political orgs, which is why the path that I choose for my community, and maybe this is why I'm a smaller content creator, maybe this isn't why I'm, I'm as big, but is, is that I tell people what I think that they can do with the tools that I provided and reasonable, feasible things that I know have helped me, you know? Uh, I, I do think that there's incredible power in building up real existing social networks between marginalized people. Just there's a lot of us in my community, a lot of marginalized people in my community who could use a friend, who could use a network of friends, who could use a, a, a broader community that could help them. That would alleviate people's fears, let them live their full lives, let them uh, uh, stretch and grow and strengthen themselves. That's something I can affect. That's something you can affect. I'm not, you know, I really try to avoid just deferring these questions, but I, I, I don't want to pass judgment on everybody else, but I think it's a problem that there is a, it's the selling of a movement where there isn't a movement, you know? And I don't like that. But, uh, I like this video. I have a lot of thoughts about it. And there are certain things uh, about it that, I mean, most of this was not, I mean, you know, super surprising to me. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that we all basically agreed on, you know, how difficult it is to contend with uh, the brand, the brandification of the web. That doesn't surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me at all that we all acknowledged uh, uh, the fact that, like, you know, we are siloed off in some way or another from one another, that, that, that seriality driven by scarcity. That's just a fact. Every creator, anybody who actually goes and creates content will know that that's a fact and if, uh, that that's just a reality, that uh, our audiences perceive us as more connected than we really are in most cases. 
um, even in the cases where people are very connected, you know, uh, I know personally a number of people that were featured in this video. I've spent time with them in real life. I consider myself friends with some of them. Um, but even still, uh, there's this idea that we're all like coordinating or sitting down and going to meetings. And that's just not how it is most of the time. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. Um, but I do think that this video is valuable. I think there's a lot to be pulled from and a lot to be, I think that the analysis of this video will produce interesting results. And obviously I was in this video. So my analysis of the overall video is going to be a little bit limited, but I'm interested to see, like, for example, I really want to hear what Doe has to say about this. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Doe has to say about this when it gets around to watching this video. Um, and I want to hear what other people have to say about it. Uh, you know, people who have more distance than I do, given that I was like in the video, you know? Um, yeah. One thing I do think is cool. You know, all disagreements with the with the creators involved, uh, all disagreements with the creators involved aside, I do think it's cool that there are so many passionate people trying, you know? And that is, it gives you a little bit of hope. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Even if some of these, some of the people in this video I vehemently disagree with, and I know some of the people in this video I vehemently disagree with me. You know, uh, some of them hate me, in fact. Uh, and in some cases, it might be mutual. But, uh, but you know, uh, even still, uh, I, think it's, it's, I think it's interesting and it's fascinating that there are all these art kids trying their best on the internet to make something and uh, to varying levels of success. I think that's pretty cool. And I hope we figure out how to make it more interesting and more uh, effective. Oh, one other thing. At the end, there was a discussion of this cycle of uh, territorialization, re-territory, re-territorialization, and deterritorialization. I think that that is a constant cycle, that it is a constant process that will have to be changed over time. Uh, YouTube is going to figure out how we do certain things and they're going to figure out how to algorithmatize those things and then we have to change them. Um, one of the things that we benefit from, and I've said this always, this is true about basically the entire left, but especially those of us who are ourselves speaking from various minority positions, various uh, non-normative positions, we are hard to read, okay? People don't understand us. They don't, we are novel to them. And as a result, we have, we have a small but notable benefit to resisting uh, a capture. And that they have to, and, and, and the structures as they are have to try extra hard to capture and control us. Um, and uh, uh, like queer people, uh, our culture is changing so fast, always. Queer people are always mixing it up. We're always adapting and changing and there's new things and new conceptualizations like flying through so fast that people from the outside, uh, uh, they, they don't, they don't, they can't understand it unless they really try and then they can and then they suddenly find themselves among us. Um, and I think that's awesome and that we need to lean into that, that we need to embrace our ability to uh, evolve and continually stay uh, on the move. Um, we need to change the way we do things uh, and continually challenge our ability to disobey and not just that, but, you know, pull things along with us, you know? One thing I think that I'm, I, I was thinking about in this video is that um, there was a lot of focus 
in this video on that prof, uh, uh, pro, profilicity, pro, what, 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 why am I struggling on the term? How is it pronounced? Profil, prof, what the fuck? I'm struggling with it. Profilicity, there we go. Profilicity, why did I say profilif, profilivity? Profilicity. Um, the profilicity thing is, in my opinion, uh, subversible, right? Uh, I don't ever want to be the most famous streamer in the world. Uh, that sounds like a nightmare to me. Um, I never want to be in the p nightmare position of Mr. Beast, where he has hollowed himself out uh, because the demands of being the most popular or famous person in the world requires that you flatten yourself out. That's the only way you can get there. I never want to be there, okay? Uh, and a lot of us should accept that that's not what our end goal is. And instead, we should be like little pirate ships, making our little legends and changing the fate of the world from a underdog position, which we can do. There is a problem among YouTubers broadly, and it is not just lefties, okay, but it is YouTubers generally, that they view growth as the only thing. Well, more people w subscribing and listening to my content is always better, but it's not. You can influence the flows of things more pragmatically by doing things that don't seem like they're the immediate best path by being less reactive, by being more innovative, by saying, hold on a second, maybe it's time for me, you know, whether or not I succeed every time, maybe it's time for us to make a swing at, at being a force that bends the algorithm because something that we do is irresistibly interesting because something that we say uh, percolates outwards, you know? That was, I, I made the joke about pragmatism because people say things are, X is pragmatic. Well, if you wanna say the most pragmatic thing is to, uh, is to chase trends in the algorithm because that will get you the most growth and growth will mean you have the largest at, uh, you know, audience and the audience will mean uh, uh, that, that, you know, more people are hearing your words and well, you're better than the alternative, right? Unless that algorithm guides you into becoming the alternative, unless as a process of, you know, trying to grow your platform, you continually slice off parts of yourself that made you unique. When in reality, these algorithms are hungry and it is true that sometimes uh, being unique and standing out will leave you left in the dust, and that's unfortunately sad. Uh, the starving artist is as true as always. However, those starving artists are often the ones that are making the art that changes the world, that ends up defining the future of culture. And I think that we need to be more bold sometimes. And that includes myself. I am uh, reminding myself of my principles here as well. Um, you all know that uh, frustrate, perhaps frustratingly to some of you, I don't always do the most ideal or optimal things in the algorithm. And that's, some of it is just raw stubbornness, you know? I am who I am. And uh, I don't like changing just because people tell me to. I don't, I don't like following those rules. I have a rebel streak. Um, but also some of it is just because that's not what works for me. I won't be able to do anything that people like if I do it the way that if, if I bend myself to work the way other people want me to. And I think this, uh, this applies all the way into the leftism conversation because uh, things are tense right now and there's a temptation that the only answer is to uh, paint ourselves the color that is most appealing so that we can hope to defer a negative outcome because there's a lot of negative outcomes that are possible. But I think sometimes that means we're actually removing our power. We are 
removing our arm, you know, in advance, uh, uh, you know, so that we don't get trapped in a trap when uh, avoiding the trap in the first place might be a better option if possible. I don't know, that's a bad analogy, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Anyway, again, Sisyphus, thank you for making this video. Thank you for including me in this video. I really enjoyed talking with you. I really enjoyed this entire extended dis discourse. And uh, uh, so that's my shout out to Sisyphus. Uh, all of you, uh, please um, not only subscribe to my channel if you're watching this, uh, but also consider subscribing over to Sisyphus. I think Sisyphus has a lot to say, and I think Sisyphus is a supremely good faith actor. Um, and I think that uh, even if you don't ag agree with everything Sisyphus has to say, that uh, listening is valuable. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for listening and uh, for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed to The Demon Mama.